So we just played a little bit of um, Solange's new album, Sounds Awesome. I really loved her last album. That came out a few years ago now. Um, quick little story. I went to see Solange live. I forgot where. <laughs> it wasn't even that long ago. It was just a, cu like a couple, maybe last year, or maybe like two years ago. I forgot where it was, but it was such an amazing performance. Um, she had really good cho choreography and dancing and um, a lot of dancers on stage and a lot of um, just just very entertaining. And during one song, she actually danced down the aisle and I, and I, and I, I had managed to get really good seats for this one. So she was dancing down the aisle um, and I'm like, uh, not that close to the stage, but like on the level, you know, on the level of like, you know, stage, not stage level, but, um, you know, like the bottom level. So she's walking up and, uh, I'm maybe like seated like halfway to, to the back. I don't know. She, she was, she danced and walked up pretty far. And she ended up like three or four feet away from me. And I think that's as far back she went. Like she kind of stopped there. And like she danced with the person sitting in front of me. And I was so hyped. I was like, oh my God. And then I was just kind of like shocked. Because she was like looking right at me. Like as if like, you know, like, hey, come and dance with me too. But I was like, yo, I was frozen. I was like, holy crap. It's a lot. Like she dancing right next to me. I was like, what the hell? I was, I was in shock. Anyways, welcome to the Sunday Morning Show. It's your friendly, friendly neighborhood contrarian, bass man. What's up? We got a lot of news to cover today. Got like 21 videos lined up here. Thankfully, most of them are pretty short. And the longer ones, we can just take just, just snippets of it anyway that I've already looked at that we can go through. This has been so much news going on. I guess the biggest story right now is the the whole Christchurch shooting. And that that one's kind of a weird story. And I haven't really looked into it that much, but we'll look into it further today. All right, so let's let's get into it with the first First topic. All of this so that you could get an email from whatever, Joe Schmo's Pizza Place to hey, say... What is this? Why is it starting here? Oh, because I made it start there. Yeah. Anyways, sorry about that. All of this so that you could get an email from whatever, Joe Schmo's Pizza Place to say, hey, Roger, you're on 6th Avenue in New York City, and there's a pizza place around the block, similar to what you ate last week, go there now. And I mean, so that, that location data, I'm just trying to understand what, what advertisers are doing with the data. Well, to me, it's this whole notion that we are merely a source of data. We're no longer customers. We're no longer human beings. I want to ask the question, why is it legal? for a company that offers you email to scan what the content in order to gather the data on what you're doing. Why is it legal for the credit card processors to sell our transaction history? Why is it legal for cellular carriers to sell our location? Why is it legal for an internet company to sell any of the data about what you do and on there? And how come we didn't know about this beforehand? Well, I, Why are now all of a sudden your customers They worked your tool? really hard to cover their tracks. And, and I look at this and I go, look, now we know. We've been through this before. What these guys are doing is no different than what the robber barons did, you know, at the turn of the 20th century. We need Teddy Roosevelt to come in here and, you know, put some balance back in the economy. Right now, I mean, you've got this problem. Like, artificial intelligence should be the penicillin of the 21st century. But nobody can do a startup there because Google, Facebook, and everybody else have hired every artificial intelligence person in the country. They go to every university and hire whole departments. So there's nobody available to do startups. They basically block competitors from coming along. And we see this with Google in China now, right? Where, you know, you've got this situation where Google says to the Defense Department, you can't regulate us because you need our AI, right? And then they go to China and go, hey, would you like our search engine based on the same AI? Well, right? you're, you're hitting on a lot of really important things. Yeah. So, um, and I should have really paused it a little bit sooner before he stepped into um, talking about China, but 
As far as what he was starting off with uh, in this segment, um, talking about how um, corporations and companies, tech companies, they take our data, they make money off of our data. Um, this is pretty much common knowledge now, but as early as, you know, maybe like even five years ago, maybe, or definitely like 10 years ago, if you said, oh, these companies are using our data and tracking us and, um, sell, you know, using our information, selling our information, if you said that, to most people they'd be like oh wow you're a conspiracy theorist you think they're you think the government would let these companies take all our data and sell it huh and now it's like a common thing uh you know that sometimes it's it's sometimes i guess maybe most of the time it's up front it you know if you read those um agreements that you hit accept on whenever you install a program or you you know uh sign up with company there's these terms and conditions and a lot of times now in those terms and conditions they let you know that you know we're, we're using your data and we're, we're, we might sell it to third parties stuff like that it's pretty much accepted now and you, you know out in the open uh but it, it wasn't always like that, and uh, people didn't really uh, believe that they were their data was being harvested, uh, you know, as 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 early as five or ten years ago, and and um, you know, it, I, I I totally agree that that um, these these companies like when we're talking about Fang once again F A A N G Fang if you have heard of that term. It's um, basically like the big tech companies, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. Uh, you know, especially Google. They take so much. They take they take so much data. Think about it. Uh, you know, the search engine, the email, the Google Drive, the Google Maps. One company has access to pretty much your entire life. Um, you know, do you use Google Pay? You know, you do you pay doing with that? And they that's another aspect that they that they uh, that they get, and they trade information with one another. It's not like just all the stuff that Google takes from you is the only thing they have access to. They buy that that information from other companies as well, and uh, you know, with that information, they can you know make a lot of money at the at the smallest, most uh, least harmful level. They can target you very specifically with ads okay if you hop on facebook and then you see these ads about things that you uh you know you've searched recently or or even uh anything that you've talked about out in the open let's say you have alexa or something like that or you know you, you keep your mic you, you know you have a computer that that's not that secure has your has your mic open and stuff like that or some some phones even start saying like, oh, you know, I really need a new toaster, man. I could really use a toaster, a toaster, a toaster, a toaster. And then uh, you start seeing it, it show up on uh, websites that use Google ads, which is pretty much all the websites. And then uh, you start seeing it automatically. All right. So let's continue with this. Yesterday, General uh, Joe Dunford, he's the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He tells a Senate panel uh, that Google is helping the Chinese military indirectly uh, through its work with the Chinese government and leading state-owned companies inside the communist nation. So Google says, we're not, we're, we're not going to do evil, U.S. government. We're not working with you. We don't want to be anywhere near your immigration policy. We're going to walk away from a deal with the Pentagon. And yet they're willing to help China, the communist okay. country. And this is precisely the thing that makes me sad, because after 9-11, when everybody was terrified, right, it was very convenient for our security services to have Google doing surveillance on everybody, right? But they didn't think through what's the downside, which is they're a corporation, they're going to sell to anybody. Yeah, that's incredible. That, that, I mean, you would think that America could rely on its leading technology companies in this race with China. China is about to overtake America in AI. Well, wanna... And not only that, but um, Google is, uh, is helping China with their social credit score, which has... Um, 
uh, you know, it's already in effect and people are already seeing the consequences like thousands. Well, actually, no, it was like because, you know, China has like a like a, over a billion people. So even a million is not even a big percentage. But I think they were saying like I think I read somewhere like a million people or close to that number around that number um have been affected so far by the social credit score where like uh whatever you know if they have a, a, an opinion that goes against the official uh party you know the, the communist party then um you know they they end up getting their businesses blocked from loans and um they get locked out of jobs and things like that talk to you about this. This is according to a new study by by the Allen Institute. Research is finding that China will publish more of the most cited 50% of papers than America. Hey, what's up, Corey? For the first time this year. And that America's share of the most cited 10% of papers declined from a high of 47% in 82 to a low of 29% in 2018. Let me tell you why this doesn't worry me quite as much as, as as the issue in China. And that is because what China is doing with AI is behavioral modification. They're a communist country, they have centralized control, and they're trying to modify the behavior of their people to get them to do the right thing. They've got data on everybody. Well, my point is what Facebook and Google do is also behavior modification. And my point is that's not what we should be great at. We should be using AI to empower our citizens. We should have literally thousands of different AI companies out doing different things with it, not trying to do behavioral modification. So what I really want to do is to make sure that Facebook and Google and the others can't gather all the AI resources and focus all our energy on the one place where China is not only going to win, but where we shouldn't want to win. We shouldn't want to win in behavioral modification. We shouldn't want to win in, you know, instead of using, here's one of the things that really scares me. These guys track your mouse movement. And the first day when I get older and my hand slows down and gets a little wobbly, maybe I've got a neurologic condition, maybe I got Parkinson's, they're gonna know. They'll be the first people on earth. Wow, to well, get wow, this. that's a big- They're under no obligation to tell me. They're not only that, they're not even under an obligation to keep it secret. They can sell to the highest bidder, which will be my insurance company, that's will incredible. either raise my rates or drop my coverage. And I'm sitting there and going, hang on, what they could do instead is have an insurance product that says, hey, look, we're tracking your mouse coverage. You know, you." You're, you need to go to the doctor, right? That would be the right thing to do. That's my point here. Is if, if all we could do is get these tech companies to look at us as human beings, as customers, instead of always looking at us as a source of data, all this would be fine. There is a good version of every one of these technologies. Mm. It's just you have to treat the people as the customer instead of as like an oil well of data. How did they get away with this? Well, they got away with it because there are no rules right now in the business world, right? I mean, right so, now you can do whatever you want. So, Roger, where is this going? You've got Elizabeth Warren out saying, I'm, uh, you know, maybe we need to be thinking about breaking these companies up. You've got last year, at the end of last year, Kevin McCarthy calling all these guys down. To- we're actually going to uh, look at a video where Warren talk- talks about this very thing, and uh, it's one thing I agree with. Um, I'm actually a little bit surprised that, like, you know, I, I see a Democratic candidate with a with a policy proposal that actually makes sense. I'm like, whoa, okay, like, yes, we should be breaking up these companies. We have we have antitrust laws for a reason. They got way too much power. Amazon has way so way too much power. Apple, Google, they, you know, I mean. Ah, uh, like probably, probably the least offensive one is probably Netflix. I mean, I love Netflix. Um, and there's still plenty of uh, uh, other places to to make videos and things like that. Well, I mean, it is kind of it is kind of breaking down like uh, the studios, like the TV studios, I guess, aren't doing as well. But they still they still make money. But anyways, oh, I keep going off track here. Um, Corey, the the topics are I got them all on the side here. I don't know if you see them. So basically, what this video is saying is that. You know, like, with, like the title says, that we're we're not looked at as consumers, as uh, customers by these big companies. We're just looked at as like, uh, you know, like some fields to be harvested. You know, we're just a source of a source of data. Which you know, so they just and, and it's not. It, 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 it's you think that you you know, you're owed at least a a piece of the money that they're making off of you. Like if they. Like take your data and they're making a thousand dollars. Like, well, shit, it's it's my data. At least give me half of that, right? At least make it lucrative if you're gonna 
steal people's data and and sell it. But I guess you know that's what, that's what we need is some regulation in this area. It's a little bit too a little bit too out of control, and uh, you know maybe maybe uh, maybe they'll propose something like that where we can get a cut of at least at least that because <laughs> there's there's always going to be a way to take your data it's and and uh technology just becomes more and more advanced you know at at a rate higher than humans are able to deal with it and able to handle it to testify where is this going in terms well, of legislation let me tell you what i'm doing okay so i spent part of the day Tuesday with the antitrust division of the Justice Department. Next week I have conversations with the Federal Trade Commission that have been ongoing. So I'm working with the administration because they know there's a problem here, right? So they want to get on top of this and I don't know where they're going to come down. But my point is we're working together because I have a perspective and a look at this. Warren is absolutely correct that the notion of people who make a market shouldn't allow to also be allowed to also participate in it because that's unfair to everybody who's in it and also you shouldn't be able to use your monopoly power to hire all the ai guys or to prevent startups from happening so what warren's doing is classic teddy roosevelt okay i mean you can say i mean people put labels on all that kind of stuff but in an economic sense it's so obviously the right thing to do i don't think this is about right versus left i think it's about right versus wrong and i think you're going to see people across the whole spectrum once they understand the issues once i get a chance to talk to everybody i think you're going to see that everybody i mean this was again teddy rosa was a republican i mean Antitrust is an American concept because we always used to believe that monopoly was part of monarchy, yeah. right? And we're in favor of entrepreneurship and letting a thousand flowers bloom. That's where I'm coming from. Yeah. And it happens that Warren's right on this issue. Google has 90% market share in search. Yeah. 90%. I mean, if we were to see competitors come in, well, that would be good, but I, there haven't been any. Well, that and even like alternative uh, search engines, like for example, StartPage, which is a uh it it automatically lets you browse with https i think but also it's supposed to be a little bit more private than going just straight through google but it uses google's like search uh search engine methods or uh, i don't even know how it works but they basically use google but put their own filter on it or something like that i don't know i think duck duck, duck go might might be like that too, maybe. Actually, I, they're actually stick, oh, wait, but weird. they're not sticking. No, they don't have the economic value. They don't that, have the market share. No, that's true. But there are alternatives. I use a thing called DuckDuckGo. You simply do because, use DuckDuckGo okay. because they do not. They do not track me, right? You, you've talked about DuckDuck. Well, I talk about all these guys because I mean I you use Apple products duck, duck. because they protect me from Google. I use DuckDuckGo. <laughs> I use Ghostery, which makes sure that nobody can track me. And you know, I try to avoid Google all the time. And I'm, I've got a podcast later today, and the guy requires you use Chrome, and so it's like I had to use it. I'm, Anyway, I treat it like a video game. But, but Apple really has tried to let customers believe that it is really protecting their privacy, well, that it's a priority. The company's debuting a new commercial yesterday with the tagline, privacy, that's iPhone. Here's a piece of it. Watch this. I'm not showing no Apple ad. I mean, Apple got their users' information jacked, like, not that long ago. They got hacked. Act Apple IDs in China. A 16 year old hacked Apple and stole 90 gigabytes of secure files. What is BGR? The fuck is that? Next story. Friday tonight, you go to the uh, grocery store and you see two types of fish, right? One of them says farmed and the other one says wild. You'd think wild is a lot better, right? Is it? 
Here's Natasha Sweet. U.S. regulators are clearing the way to put... <laughs> no, I'm telling you, there's been a lot of hacks on, on Apple. No, I... Yeah, that would be of, like, sensitive data. Uh, what is this? Apple deeply apologetic for payment app phishing. I mean, there's a lot of... You gotta... Hacks on hacks. I don't know. Franken fish on your dinner plate. Yes, that's genetically modified salmon. But you're more likely here the term genetically engineered, but don't be fooled, it's the very same thing. Now on Friday, the Food and Drug Administration lifted an alert that had prevented Aqua Bounty from importing its genetically modified salmon eggs to its Indiana facility. Once grown, they would be sold as food. The FDA approved Frankenfish in 2015, claiming the Canadian engineered Aqua Advantage salmon safe to eat and no biological difference between these salmon and from those in the wild. But in 2016, Congress blocked the FDA from selling the fish in the U.S. until labeling guidelines went into effect, warning customers the fish they're buying is indeed genetically modified. So in December, the USDA required manufacturers to label their genetically modified products with a text symbol or link. According to Aqua Bounty, the fish are bred to be female and sterile, addressing concerns if these fish get into the open ocean. But the Center for Food Safety says the company's tests are not 100 percent, meaning there's no guarantee these fish are in fact sterile. The Center for Food Safety is suing the FDA, hoping to prevent the sale of genetically modified fish before it even begins. In Los Angeles, Natasha Sweet, RT. Sanchez, you found us on YouTube. Yeah, so... Man. GMO fish. There's... There's, you know, it, it, there's no perfect science. Like, there's going to be a, one of those fish that is not sterile. It's going to just mix in with the wild fish. And then it's just all going to be a bunch of mutant fish float, floating around. And I've gone to, like, one of the... When I, when I went to a... Uh, technology festival I, I sat down and i sat through a whole presentation about of aqua bounty i think it was the same company maybe or, or some similar company where they really try to explain the benefits of gmo fish and like um they really they really try hard to sell you on it and it, it's um it, it is it is somewhat convincing you know when you watch it but I just, uh, I really, I really don't trust these companies, you know, like I don't trust, I don't trust big organizations, big, you know, things like that, you know, like big, big companies or, you know, I don't trust government, obviously. It's like when you get a bunch of people together, when they got a lot of power and, uh, you know, I don't know who, 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 uh, funds Aqua Bounty. I don't know. I don't know who, uh, gives them money. You know, I don't, you know, I don't trust that shit. I trust Mother Nature. I know, I know, I know for sure Mother Nature's not trying to fuck me over. So that's why when I eat fish, I want the wild caught fish. But then they say the wild caught is even, you gotta, you gotta make sure you get it from the right place, the right source. It's, it's getting so complicated now. I mean, people say that, that there won't be any more wild-caught fish eventually in a few years or something like that. But I don't know, man. I'm not going to be eating bugs. Uh, that's all I'm saying. I'm not eating any bugs. So you can cut it out right now with the bugs and the, and the meat that they're trying to scientifically produce from feces and shit like that. Let's see. Let's see. Hold on a second. Is that on YouTube? Feces meat. I'm not eating the feces meat. I'm not eating the shit burger. That's not... No.
Professor Ikeda has invented the first steaks based on proteins from human excrement. Sewage mud is rich in protein because it is alive with bacteria. These bacteria are harmless because they are killed by heat during the manufacturing process. The red color is obtained by using food coloring. The artificial steak, according to initial tests, even tastes like beef. In fact, to refine the flavor, Professor Ikeda adds soy protein. It's 63% protein, 25% carbohydrates, 3% lipids, and 9% minerals to make one turd burger. <laughs> まずこちらの過程で、タンパク質を取り出して、最後に半の補充剤を加えて、反応装置、エクスクローダーにかけて、人工肉を作っています。Professor Ikeda believes the main problem is the psychological barrier. 確かに人間が出したものだということに対してですね、なんかそうそうそれを食べたいっていう人は多分あんまりいないんじゃないかなと思っています。この人工肉を作るための According to Professor Akida, the turd burger has an obvious advantage other than completing the food chain. Bon appetit! Bon apple teeth! <laughs> <laughs> oh no. No, no, no. See, no. I'm not I'm not no. Nope. I remember and I I wonder if you do too uh, a period when um this space began to get sharper and nastier. The 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 some of the blogs became more strident, uh more ideological. Um, uh, it's part of the world that we're living in now, which we'll come to. But do you re remember uh, a way in which um, this pervasive technology, sometimes combined with anonymity... That's the um, creator of the Internet, by the way. ...that shielded people, let them say inflammatory things they wouldn't say if their names were attached. Do you remember a, a period when that was beginning to seem troublesome to you? So I don't really... Uh, so I suppose... The, uh, the blogosphere wasn't really what happened, it was the social networks where it happened. And I suppose the, the, the first thing you notice about social network is that you don't get this vir virtuous cycle of people desperately trying to get their thing linked to in the open web, because when you write something on a, a social network, it's the social network's algorithm which decides who gets to read it. Uh, and, and so you, people may, uh, they may give you likes, and so you get, uh, instead of having the, the hit counter go up, you get the like counter going up, and you get a sort of the dopamine kick from that. But, uh, but one way of looking at it is, is, is just to say, well, the social network, you know, the blogosphere was one system, the social network is a different system, it works in a different way, and it has different results. And one of the ways it works is it allows people to keep track of all their old friends and keep in touch with family, uh, even if they're, they're all in different countries, and so it, uh, in, to a certain extent it does wonderful things. But then on the other hand, the whole, uh, I think some people will say, well, it, you can point at advertising. Because so long as you're actually paid for by advertising, so long as at the end of the day, the people who last out, the people who are actually generating content, who are either writing content, who are writing programs that generate content, uh, those people, when those people, uh, the, if, uh, the, they are, in the end, uh, in fact, rewarded just by advertising. Then even if they are sort of innocent kids in Venice, Macedonia, the famous case where during the Trump campaign, 
They, were treat, uh, they had various websites. They would tweet things, point to the websites, and they found, and Google Ads was rewarding them. And they would just, you know, they would keep track on the wall, not of how many hits they got, but how many money, how, much, how many dollars they got from Google. And Google would reward them for engagement. And they found they got more engagement if they put things which weren't actually true. Yep. So they were trained. It wasn't their fault. They were, you know, they were parts of the system. They were trained by the Google Ad system. And they, the guy on the BBC interview, one of them said, Hillary really wanted Trump to win. Yeah, that was my head, that was the best headline. I more or less, you know, more, but, but, you know, but have a Mercedes where I can buy on the basis of thing, that headline and things like it. Because, and it's the art of, the, of uh, he was very proud of the fact that all the, he trained all the local school kids uh, to be able to think what crazy headline will make people click. So Hillary really wanted to jump to win, just made everybody click. And so everybody went to the website, he cashed in, Nobody, everybody was frustrated by the fact they went to some stupid website. They probably got full sales insurance or something. Uh, and, and, and so, it's, to a certain extent, you can say it's a broken system. And some, people's, uh, some people maintain that if it's based on advertising, it's never going to be healthy. Uh, so, uh, but on the other hand, that's a very simplistic way of looking at it, too. Yeah, so he, he talks about how it's gotten out of control with, uh, you know, the... Uh the advertisements, uh, which Google, which Google does own over ninety percent or ninety some percent of internet ads, which is another monopoly that they have. Not on just search, but but on ads, especially. And so, um, you know. There's a lot of content out there that is just clickbait. That's what he's basically talking about towards the end there is uh, clickbait. And uh, in the beginning of the video, he was comparing uh, today's internet with the internet uh, pre-social media. Because before social media, you had your, you know, uh, what's it called? Your GeoCity uh, website that you put together and stuff. And... Uh, you know, you had a little hit counter on there, and I, you know, I did that too. I made a little website, and I forgot what I put on there. I think I was, I think I made a site about like Dragon Ball Z or something like that. And um, yeah, I would be, I'd be, I'd have my eye on that that hit counter. Now it's with social media, you're tracking likes and uh, retweets and comments and all that stuff. So, speaking of, of social media... Trying to silence liberty. That's how libertarians are describing big tech's crackdown on so-called hate speech that Twitter, because of that, they say they've suspended several libertarian accounts, including Ron Paul, Institute Director Daniel McAdam. So is this a deliberate effort to silence them? Here now is Dr. Ron Paul, former Texas congressman and host of the Ron Paul Liberty Report. Dr. Paul, uh, good to have you here. We have heard Thank that you. Mr. McAdam's Twitter account is back on now we have tried to contact twitter they have not returned our calls have have they made any attempt to either apologize or explain their actions to you or mr mcadams not to me but i think uh, when he was put back on there was some type of uh, an apology about it but i don't remember the wording but it was uh associated with a, a form of an apology and that they put him back on well do you think it you was know, a mistake or do you think it was a deliberate effort to silence you guys i, I think um probably both. They're deliberately attacking many libertarian conservative constitutionalists, and that is common practice. But then, then again, I think they do make mistakes. They overshoot because uh, Daniel McAdams hadn't even tweeted anything. He promoted something. Somebody else said something, and all he did was uh, retweet it. And uh, so I guess his guilt level was lower, and they decided and it might be that maybe public pressure still helps because we did get some attention on the websites, and people like you and others talk about, you know, could they be targeting right. constitutionalists and libertarians? And I do. And the construction in the background is so annoying. 
think that helps. I think it was uh, maybe helpful for uh, maybe uh, Facebook reassessing uh, their their tools and, and their techniques on how to pick and choose who gets to be uh, well, promoted on their website. You know, there are all these algorithms, you know this very well, that, that kind of alert organizations like Twitter or Facebook or whatever to, to what they call hate speech, but I can't think of anything in the libertarian jargon that would do that. Can you? No, a matter of fact, it, it, and I know you understand the message because it's built on on nonviolence, non-aggression, right. and and many times, many times we we cite Martin Luther King because he he was a peaceful person that uh, defended his position. But well, and for those for those who don't violence. know, for those who aren't familiar with it, con conservatives very often chide you libertarians <laughs> as being too soft on things like defense. So if anything, as you say, it would be more peaceful message than most conservative websites. But it does lead one to, to, to question whether an entire generation that is now dependent on social media is being kind of led by the nose by editorialists at Twitter or at Facebook uh, who don't believe in, in what you espouse, that is a strong support of the free market and a condemnation of socialism. Yeah, and, and what you're talking about is a real challenge to us, and I've talked about it on my program, is first off, uh, do they have a right to do this? And we would argue they're private, they do have a right, right. and they monitor, and my web page, I can keep people off if they're being ugly and nasty and all these kind of things. But the question is, are they getting any support from the government? And that is where I come down on the side that, yes, they do. They accommodate the government. They provide information to the government. Mm. They, get, they get money in directly when it was developed. Uh, they get advertisement from the government. Now, Facebook has just decided that they use Atlantic Council people to help them sort this out and find out. Uh yeah, Facebook was actually, for example, Facebook was funded into existence by NQTEL, uh, a CIA front company. Let's see, NQTEL. <laughs> this one says it right right there what big tech has acquired from inqtel the cia's vc arm the government helped shape the internet so it should come to no surprise that it also it's also game to invest in the companies working to bring it to new heights inqtel the venture arm of the cia has invested in 172 known startups more than 20 of which crunchbase news has reached out to for comment according to crunch crunchbase but like with any other vc firm exit exits matter and a handful of inqtel backup startups have found themselves in the shopping carts of the most well-known tech companies in the world google in 2004 google acquired inqtel backed keyhole for an undisclosed sum but whatever google spent on this startup was likely worth it blah 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 and da, 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 da. announced in 2016, Google bought API management platform Apigee. At the time, do, 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 Amazon, like Google, Amazon has acquired two startups that count InQtel as an investor. Big tech acquisitions of InQtel funded startups. Acquired company, business, acquire, purchase price. Mostly un nanotech. Interesting. Hmm. Uh, uh, who should be censored and who should be not. Look into the Atlantic Council. It's a big government organization. And guess who donates a lot of money to? It's Facebook. So that's a facade. They're, they're not really, you know, that's what they're doing is hiding. Facebook said, you know, uh, if, if, some, if somebody disagrees, we'll just send them to the, to the inspectors that we're hiring to sort this out the for The censors. But and no, and some isn't. people call them inspectors. Yeah. Uh, you and I would call them censors. I, I, I'm short on time, but i got to ask, do you think the rise of of people like Ocasio Cortez and and other socialists within within the Democratic Party, particularly their appeal to millennials, are because of the fact that you have these these editors or, or censors, if you will, working for social media sites. 
I, th I think uh, partially is the case, but I'm not going to give uh, the socialists uh, too much credibility. Yeah, yeah, there was an election won, but uh, you know, when we do some talking to young people, I find out that a lot of people don't buy into that. Yeah. So sometimes the polling, when you really get to the young people, you know, they sort of like this idea of peace and prosperity. Right. Something we advertise <laughs> that for. Ain't bad. Yeah. You know, people. You know what I always say is, young people at the age of 18 don't all of a sudden get up and 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 want big government and more taxes of po right. poverty and we need another war that yeah. young people don't volunteer and march forward so i think the good morning yeah Corey says every fucking day they talk about ocasio cortez man yeah i mean she's the darling of the democratic party they're gonna be talking about her um you know they, they talk about omar a lot too um because they say and do things that are controversial. Um, so, in uh, in a sense, they kind of uh, have the the same effect that Donald Trump has by being controversial. They end up in the news all the time. Uh, I mean, they're setting her up to be the darling. I mean, uh, I saw I saw a video that that put into question uh her social media popularity like uh they were showing her numbers glitching out like going from 5k likes to like 17k likes like back and forth and then it stayed to 17k i was like wow like i mean with today's technology you could kind of fake that kind of video but you know i think it's probably easier to fake numbers because like you know that kind of stuff can be hacked um i mean I know, I know, I know a hundred percent for sure. Like I've seen, I've seen it done on YouTube where people live streaming will use view bots to increase their view numbers. So one can only assume it's just as easy to do on Twitter. And somehow, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a hacker or anything. The uh, the Omar thing, what she said about Israel. What, well, what do you think about it, Corey? Uh, you can type it into the comments as we look into continue the story. Uh, this is, a, I think, an interview of Warren talking about breaking up Amazon, Apple, Google, and Facebook. And so far, this is the most attractive policy that I've heard uh, any of the Democrats uh, candidates talk about, uh, any of the candidates that are running for president. And welcome to Face the Nation. We begin this morning with the already packed field of potential candidates. Whoa, are you serious? <laughs> Whoa, are you serious? I, what? <laughs> Yo, what? <laughs> it's like the Royal Rumble. Wait, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, sixteen. Oh man, isn't that is that the same number or more than the Republicans the, the amount of Republicans in 2016? Oh man, that's hilarious. <laughs> that's hilarious. Oh, it's a kid. Oh, there was 17. Cory Booker. N no. <laughs> Never heard of this guy. Pete Butt a gig. <laughs> Pete Butt a gig. Yo. No, he no. He's he, he's a no as well cuz can you just imagine uh Trump uh debating this guy? <laughs> Pete Butt <-a> gig. <laughs> <laughs> uh julian castro okay i'm surprised that he's uh already because uh, he's uh i forget which one's newer him or his brother um he's actually like a congressman from texas and uh people were crazy about him in texas 
Um, and he could be a good contender because, I mean, he's young and attractive, you know, got the Obama thing going for him. So, who knows? This guy, <laughs> this guy looks funny. <laughs> John Delaney, Tulsi Gabbard, Kristen Gillibrand, Kamala Harris, John Hickenlooper. We're actually going to look at a, a video where Face the Nation talks to John Hickenlooper. I can't even see their names here. Who are these guys? Then you got Warren, Marianne Williamson, Andrew Yang, Bernie Sanders, Howard Schultz, William Weld. Yeah, he was a Republican. Well, oh, this is the, the campaign in total. Okay, so this is the Independent and this is the Republican. Oh, right, yeah, I did read that this guy is running against Donald Trump. Um... For the Republican candidacy, but he doesn't have, really have a chance. And uh, I, th I thought a couple other Republicans were trying to fight for the primary. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, we we shouldn't be uh, giving. We we should definitely uh, cut off foreign aid to a lot of countries, especially uh, Israel. And Israel is a she's right. I mean, like Israel is a terrorist nation. I mean, it uh, and it was created by the British after World War Two. They kicked they you know displaced hundreds of thousands or even millions of Palestinians uh, to create the uh, Jewish state of Israel. So. Uh, well, what I what I think is that uh, you got some uh, old bloodlines of powerful people living in Israel that basically are kind of like fake Jews that what you would call a a Zionist. Um, that these are basically just powerful rich people who uh, manipulate world events and hide behind Judaism because. If you have any kind of criticism against uh, a Jew after World War II, then you're called an anti-Semite. So it's the perfect thing to hide behind if you're some fucking, uh, if you're like some kind of uh, villain, some kind of criminal, some kind of, uh, you know, psychopath that, uh, you know, families like the Rothschilds and uh, the Rockefellers and stuff like that. I I really uh, haven't looked into any of the policies of any of these candidates. Um, I've just seen random a couple random things like um, with Warren. I heard about her wanting to break up Fang. With Kamala Harris, I heard about you know she said she wants to legalize marijuana and uh, uh, legalize prostitution, and neither of those. On Kamala's, not, neither of those policies that Kamala's bringing is really a decision maker for me. It doesn't, I don't think it, you know, because the country's already headed towards legalization of marijuana. And I don't really, I mean, it'd be nice if prostitution was legalized because a lot of people get, get sent through the criminal justice system off of prostitution. And I think that's just a waste because if, you know, if both parties consent, then, you know, why is, you know, just figure out a way to tax it or possibly or, you know, that's that would that would be the incentive for a politician to legalize it to uh, get tax revenue. And we do need to pay off this national debt. So, you know, we should be making more things legal and just finding ways to, to tax it. And then you pay off the debt. And, uh, yeah, but I, so I haven't heard about what Tulsi Gabbard has to say, but what, what's, what's a policy that stands out to you, Corey, as far as, uh, Tulsi Gabbard? Corey says, if I could run against Trump and automatically get elected, I would definitely run. He says, Trump is like a democratic free pass. No wonder they have so many nominees. 
Uh, he only won because they ran against Clinton. Warren is okay, but she comes off as desperate. Has a Clinton vibe to her. She wants to be liked. Yeah, I, yeah. Specifically, when she did that video, that that was. It was like, <coughs> sorry. She like stole uh, AOC style, cutting up vegetables in the kitchen, making a low quality video for social media. Yeah, she has kind of like a, a Clinton vibe, like a Clinton light kind of vibe to her. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't really trust any of these guys, any of the, any of the people, Trump included. Like, I really don't trust any of them. But um, I would like to see Fang get broken up if if that's like a if that's something that uh, but it could just end up being like another campaign promise that doesn't get fulfilled. You know, it it could just you know, because Trump Trump got elected on build the wall, and he's not you know he hasn't built the wall, <laughs> you know. At least in the way that that he uh, had had uh, promoted, like oh, a straight up wall from from end to end, from C to C. Now it's more like how it's always been is really just sections of barriers um, set up at strategic points. Um, so that could be a similar thing, as far as Warren, uh, you know, maybe. She campaigns on breaking up Fang, but what more realistically might happen is maybe she gets them to take less tax breaks or, you know, they pay a little bit more taxes this time around. I don't know. And there are signs that former Vice President Joe Biden is planning to enter the race next month. A new poll out this morning shows him. Didn't he just? Con doesn't he just confirm that he's running? That's going to be hilarious because Joe Biden's a fucking pedophile. There's so many pictures of him, like video of him, like just getting too close to little girls. Leading in Iowa with Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders close behind. A handful of those candidates appeared over the weekend at the South by Southwest Festival in Austin. CBS News political correspondent Ed O'Keefe caught up with one of the big names in the race, Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren, and asked about her new proposal to break up tech companies like Amazon, Apple, Google, and Facebook. The giant tech companies right now are eating up little tiny businesses, startups, uh, and competing unfairly. Look at it this way. Someone like Amazon runs a platform, you know, the place where you buy your coffee maker and get it delivered in 48 hours, and that's great. But in addition to that, they're sucking up all that information about every purchase, every sale, and every one of the other little businesses that are offering their products on Amazon. And when Amazon sees one that's profitable, they say, hmm, I think we'll go into business against them now that they've got all this extra information. And they put their own business out there to compete on selling coffee makers, put themselves on page one, put the competitor back on page six, and the competitor's business is just gone. So what I'm saying is we've got to break these guys apart. You want to run a platform? That's fine. You don't get to run a whole bunch of the businesses as well. You want to run a business? That's fine. You don't get to run the platform. Think of it this way. It's like in baseball. You can be the umpire or you can own one of the teams. But you don't get to be the umpire and own the teams. And let me just get this clear. In, if you had your way, Facebook would have to sell off Instagram. Mm -hmm. Amazon would have to sell off Whole Foods. All those little businesses that they're running, competing businesses. Yep. I, I, who, who is the federal government to tell these companies they have to do that? Uh, there's antitrust law. It's been around for more than 100 years. And the federal government has done this many times. For example, broke up Standard Oil, uh, broke up the, the uh, great monopolies of the late 19th century and early 20th century. And the reason for that is so that we can keep a competitive economy. This idea has gotten a lot of criticism. From? Howard Schultz, the guy who's yeah. thinking about running as an independent. A billionaire, right? Yes, uh -huh. um, and he, he suggested that your proposal is, quote, inconsistent with our free enterprise system and said that it's emblematic of Democrats proposing, his word, fantasy ideas 
that will never be implemented. And that instead, perhaps you could just find ways to discuss with these companies ways to make it more competitive. You mean we could ask these multi-billion dollar companies nicely if they would not eat up the competition and um, just behave better in the marketplace? Really? We've had laws around against antitrust activity and predatory pricing for over a hundred years because we understand that the way markets work are when there's real competition in that market. And you know that this uh, kind of proposal feeds into the arguments that Republicans have been making to label Democrats as anti-capitalist, adopting these socialist ideas. The reality is it is not capitalism to have one giant that comes in and dominates, a monopolist that dominates a market. What I have supported all the way through are the kinds of things that help level the playing field. So I think a level playing field says that the big guys have to pay kind of like everybody else does and they have to pay to help create some opportunities for that. But you know you're getting labeled uh, and you're getting coupled in with a few of your other democratic contenders as someone who is, supports socialist ideas. Can we, do we describe you as a capitalist? What's the best way to yeah. describe you? I believe in markets. Markets that work, markets that have a cop on the beat and have real rules and everybody follows them. I believe in a level playing field. So if you get labeled as a socialist? Well, it's just wrong. Silicon Valley has obviously been a reliable source of democratic financial support, uh, especially in recent cycles. Given this proposal, um, are you going to decline financial support from tech executives or tech employees if they decide to get your campaign? <laughs> Look, nobody's been beaten down the door, but let me be clear. I'm not in Washington to work for billionaires. I'm in Washington to help level the playing field so that everybody gets a chance to get out there and compete. Right now, with giants like Amazon and, and Google and Facebook, do you know how venture capitals talk about the space around them? They call it the kill zone because they don't want to fund businesses in that space because they know Amazon will eat them up, Facebook will eat them up, Google will eat them up. We need a chance for every one of the young people in that room to thrive, to get their idea out there. And if it turns out to be the next Google, good for them. You said nobody's beating down the door. How is fundraising going for you? Uh, as far as I know, it's going great. You know, it's a lot of small dollar fundraisers, and here's been the fun part. I've actually been calling people who donated $25, $5, $50, $10, and had some great conversations with folks. I get a chance to ask them, why you gotten, what, what pulled you into this? And people talk about the things that matter most to them. The House this past week had to vote on a resolution condemning hate of all sorts because of what one congresswoman had said, Ilhan Omar of Minnesota. I want to talk about the political influence in this country that says it is okay for people to push for allegiance to a foreign country. There are many considered it anti-Semitic, others said it's being misinterpreted. What's your view on what she said? Look, my view is that we condemn anti-Semitism and Islamophobia wherever it appears. We are a democracy, and in a democracy, we have to talk about our differences. Uh, we need to do so with respect, uh, but ultimately, we need to hammer out the best policies for this country, and that means a lot of frank and full discussion. Was she unfairly targeted? Look, right now, what we've got is a condemnation of anti Semitism and Islamophobia uh, and other forms of hatred. Hatred is. Yeah, so uh, I don't I don't think that she has that great of a chance of um, of being elected, especially after that whole um, that whole that whole thing about her being uh, part Native American and, uh, you know, that whole thing. That's 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 going to turn a lot of people off, but she is smart to to tackle this this uh, 
you know, this policy to bring this to bring this idea uh, into the uh, into the debate, you know, into the conversation. Um, I think that work, works great, even if she doesn't get elected. This, if that becomes a like a big topic during the uh, Democratic primary debates, then another candidate might adopt that same idea to break up Fang. Which, you know, would be really tough. I mean, we're talking about some of the biggest companies in America. And they've, you know, if they don't have the lobbying power at this point to to make sure that doesn't happen, I'm sure by the time whoever gets elected uh, is in power that uh, they'll have the lobbyists take care of, they take care of them and make sure that uh, they don't get broken up. These are billion dollar companies. They got a lot of money. All right. So uh, this guy that I never heard of, Hickenlooper. Let's let's see what he has to say about <laughs> about his candidacy. And his full interview with Senator Warren is available on our website, FaceTheNation. And uh, a reason why I chose to look at this because he actually responds to um, some of um, Warren's uh, points. Calm. Now, the latest candidate to enter the race to beat President Trump is former Colorado Governor John Hickenlooper. He announced his candidacy Thursday. I'm not the first person in the race or the most well-known person in the race. But let me tell you, at four syllables and 12 letters, Hickenlooper is now the biggest name in the race. And now the biggest name in the race joins us live from Austin. Uh, Governor, welcome to Face the Nation. Thanks for having me on. Is it a good idea to do what Senator Warren is advocating there with breaking up big tech companies? Well, I think you've got to look at the, the environment and, and how the system is working. And for, you know, for several decades now, increasingly, uh, people in the middle class and poor people in this country haven't had the security and opportunity that our economic system used to create for them. So what is the reason why we're seeing such a large number a uh, decline in the number of startups, people starting businesses? And maybe some of that is due to these large companies that, you know, usually when someone's going to start a business, they're already a successful employee somewhere. Maybe they're looking at that landscape and saying, ah, these companies are too big, I can't get in. And I think that's one of the arguments that she's trying to make. Uh, we have to make sure that we have a competitive system whereby little guys feel they've got an honest, a decent chance to succeed. So you do think tech companies have too much influence over the economy? No, I'm, what I'm saying is that they are, uh, in many circumstances, becoming so large that they make it harder for small companies to compete. I'm not, again, to make a blanket statement about all tech companies, you know, they're too big, uh, I think that would be a, a little bit over going too far. But I do think it's legitimate to say, how do we make sure that we have more competition in such a way that we encourage you know, people to start their own businesses? That's where job creation happens, is, is when you get small businesses. You know, people like me, I got laid off, and I ended up starting first one restaurant company, then another restaurant company, then you know, I took old warehouses and turned them into loft projects. But we created thousands of jobs in that process, and we're able to you know, stimulate a whole part of Denver and, and other you know, cities and towns across the Midwest. That's what drives this country and always has. And, and we're seeing a decline in the number of people willing to start up businesses. Well, I, I want to offer you the chance to clear something up here because you did an interview earlier in the week where you were asked three times if you would call yourself a proud <laughs> capitalist. And you wouldn't directly answer the question. Uh, it led Howard Schultz, uh, who's possibly a candidate, to say, if even a successful businessman and entrepreneur like Governor Hickenlooper can't openly support capitalism, the Democratic primary, it's clear this is Senator Sanders' party now. Why are you uncomfortable calling yourself a proud capitalist? Well, I've been, uh, the point I was making is that we define people by these labels that, that often have all kinds of associations and baggage with them. Uh, in that sense. Do I believe in small business? Of course I believe in small business. I started probably more than 20 different small businesses. Uh, I'd have, you know, in, a, in, in one year I'd have over a million customers. I understand that, but what's happening, I think it's kind of a silly question. We should be looking at some of the reasons 
behind why we have less and less startups. We should look sure. at some of the reasons why you know, more and more people aren't wanting to start a business. Sure, but you understand that but, it is a, a main Republican talking point to label Democrats right now as anti-business socialists. <laughs> right, but that's ridiculous. Obviously, so you there are, would reject the that. Your party is a big ten. You reject that label. Yes, absolutely. I think that's uh, not accurate, and I think that uh, as your interview with Elizabeth Warren showed, there are all kinds of, of, of different people making up the Democratic Party. And do I believe in in free markets? Do I believe that you know you put capital to work uh, to to create jobs and and improve your community? You know. Back when I was a kid, businesses understood that part of their job wasn't just to make as much profit as they could, but it was to c create the community. Once you get back into these labels, am I a capitalist, am I a socialist, how much of, how much of a capitalist yeah. am I versus how much of a socialist, that c becomes kind of silly, doesn't it? Well, I mean, in a funny way, the other candidates were comfortable you know, answering the question, so I wanted to offer you a chance to to answer. I understand you're not comfortable directly answering, I, 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 but I, I want to. Yeah, that guy has no chance. No chance if that's what you got. Equality between what he called anti. -Z Welcome to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. Who would have thought a Somali-born Muslim woman elected to Congress would ignite a long overdue national conversation? Also, Trump wants to make the military-industrial complex great again. talking some real news. I'm joined by my guest, Dmitry Babich. He's a political analyst with Sputnik International. And in Athens, we cross to Alex Christoforo. He is the director and writer for the Duran.com. All right, gentlemen, crosstalk rules in effect. That means you can jump anytime you want, and I always appreciate it. Let me go first to Ath uh, Athens. Alex, um, Congress Congresswoman Omar, her greatest sin was not saying anything remotely anti-Semitic, not even actually anti-Israel. Her sin was, is to reveal the very cozy relationship relationship Congress has with APAC and with Israel and she got plummeted from uh, for it on all across the aisle both sides and the media continues to misrepresent what she actually said and let me point out here it's probably the only issue that I would agree with her on and I think that what's that's is what makes this national conversation very very important go ahead and Athens yeah I agree with you on that I don't Reading her comments, I don't think there was there was anything that controversial as to what she said. She said something that many people in D.C. I'm sure are well aware of, and and everybody that's watching this show I'm sure is well aware of. But the the interesting part about this whole story, Peter, is I think the the anti-Semitic Israel stuff is more of a more of a sideshow. The real story to all of this, to me at least, was watching the Democrats having to deal with: Do we condemn? a black Muslim immigrant woman, or do we condemn comments about Israel anti-Semitism? And this speaks to the intersectionality that is plaguing the Democrats and the United States as a whole. Everything is being dissected and chopped up into little bits. And now you have the ultimate conundrum. You have Omar speaking, may maybe you consider it disparaging comments about Israel or, or Jews, but maybe not. But the point is, is that you have the Democrats now and Pelosi trying to figure out what do we do here? Do we go after Omar? Do yep. we go after Israel? Is it anti-Semitic? What do we do? At the end of the day, Peter, they ended up condemning everybody. Everybody, right. <laughs> you know, Dima, all I'm doing is eating popcorn watching this entire thing happen, particularly to the Democratic Party, because as Alex Grisofora pointed out here, I mean, you see a party that is more and more divided, and it's because of identity politics, exactly. okay? And I think it's also very important here is that it is a fundamental orthodoxy. It is a taboo subject to talk about the cozy relationship uh, that uh, Congress has with APEC. And, and there's a lot of um, members of Congress 
Congress. Um, it is alleged that have dual citizenship. Um, mm -hmm. That does bring up interesting questions here, particularly when you're looking at American foreign policy in the Middle East here. Again, she, she's broken a lot of taboo, uh, taboos, but people, uh, all of Washington, D.C. knows these things, but talking about it is not, it's taboo, is, yeah. it's not well, allowed. It's a, it's a global taboo because basically in France there was a big scandal uh, just last week, uh, President Macron decided to put the sign of equality between what he called anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. And in fact, by anti-Zionism, if you look at his statements, he meant any criticism of the foreign policies of the state of Israel, uh, or any criticism of uh, unqualified support that the United States and the European Union give to Israel when Israel has uh, some kind of a conflict with its neighbors. Uh, in fact, you know, there was not a single Syrian soldier who entered the Israeli territory. There was not a single Syrian fighter jet that would bomb or, or, or uh, shoot at targets on the Israeli territory. Always defensive. There were dozens dozens of bombing raids by, by Israeli aviation during the last few years. Against whom? Against a country which is in raptures of a civil war. And, and not noticing it is, is just yeah. Yeah, decent, you know. Exactly. Let me, let me go back to Athens here. Alex, also, I, I think it's really, it's interesting to me, at least, is that we have an, an immigrant a Muslim woman from Somalia um, really uh, demanding uh, us to think about what the First Amendment means as well, because you know we have we we had this spat during the 1980s, or I remember very very well, where uh, criticism of, of Israel is anti-Semitism, which is absolutely absurd on the face of it here. And again, I think this is what Congress Congresswoman Omar is uh, pointing out here: is that um, words have meaning the way you want them to be, be applied. Not there is no universal censor in in Washington that can tell you what words mean. Go ahead. Alex. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's good that, you know, she, she said these things if we decide to approach them from the standpoint of talking about policy. And we can have this debate, honestly, as to what, what people think the U.S.'s position should be vis-a-vis -vis Israel and the relationship between the two countries. Th th this is absolutely fine, but I think you're exactly right, Peter, in that what's going to happen after these comments have been forgotten is that you're going to see more censorship. You're going to see more political censorship. You're going to see more tech censorship. And that's going to be the result of these comments. And the censorship is going to take place in the form of, well, this person got on Facebook or on Twitter and they said anti-Semitic remarks. You're going to be suspended. Your account's going to be, be deleted. That's what, that's what the end result is going to be. You're going to see a more of a crackdown on the free speech, not an opening up of free speech, unfortunately. Dima. Well, in fact, I think we should differentiate between three different things. There is an unholy union of so-called liberal interventionists and American neocons uh, whose policies in the Middle East were disastrous for everyone, including Israel. Was Israel more secure after uh, George Bush the Jr. invaded Iraq? It wasn't more secure. There was more extremism in the, in the area. There were more uh, terrorist groups operating. Uh, so th there, are, there is this unholy union. Uh, there is the Israeli government, which is very radical, which won thanks to their own intimidation tactics. Uh, and there is the Israeli people and the Jewish people around the world whose interests, I think, are not really served by the liberal interventionists and the neocons. Well, I don't think, I don't think the, the way um, Israel is talked about by the powers that be in the United States is actually, in the end, good for Israel either. Absolutely. Let me go back to, to Athens here. I mean, it's, it, if you go to the pages of uh, uh, the, the new, uh, the, uh, the American conservative, you know, they, they have, they're very realist in their foreign policy. And, you know, an article comes to mind real quickly, Israel isn't a, a, an ally of the United States. I don't see what the United States gets out of it. Actually, I see only net negatives about its relationship, though you wouldn't know that from the mainstream media, which, of course, you're always, I mean, I've, I've said often in this program, in, in the American mainstream media, say as little as possible about Israel and don't say anything at all about Saudi Arabia. Uh, Alex, I, I, I just don't see that it is a, a, a mutually beneficial relationship, even I think it's de detrimental to Israel itself. Go ahead, Alex. 
Yeah, and I think that's why they're going to try to shut down o Omar, because they don't want to have this, this discussion. Exactly. The narrative is that it's that it's America's most trusted ally. No one ever goes beyond that to question why it is or why it isn't. And I want to make a point, Pete. I was very, very disappointed with how Pelosi positioned this whole thing, because at the end of the day, her statement was, well, Omar, she's, she's you know, an immigrant. She doesn't speak English very well. She doesn't understand the language very well. <laughs> I found it, instead of, you know, it's... opening up the debate, she completely shut it down and yep. then threw it on the fact that Omar is an immigrant and doesn't know what she's saying. Yeah, Dima, uh, exactly mm -hmm. the same point here. I mean, looking at how Omar is being treated, uh, she's being treated as if she was ignorant, okay? Absolutely. And it, it actually, I think there's a woof of racism right there. Absolutely. She doesn't speak English very well. She well, doesn't understand the meaning mm -hmm. of words. That is a totalitarian mindset. Absolutely. Words mean what I tell you they mean, Absolutely. and you can't think for yourself. It reminds me of the situation in the UK when Mrs. Thatcher uh, suddenly criticized the European Union her press secretary emerged and she said, Madam is very sick and she won't be making any more political comments. So this is the same kind of attitude we, we heard from uh, Mrs. Pelosi, like she's not qualified, she doesn't speak English, you know. But uh, coming back to this article in the American Conservative mm -hmm. by Daniel Larrison, right. in fact, what he says is, is interesting because he says that the United States gets nothing in return for the extensive military and diplomatic support that it provides. Well, the United States doesn't get it, but the ideology of neocons does get it because uh, how do the neocons justify their destruction of Iraq, their destruction of Libya, their destruction of Syria? They justify it by the defense of Israel. So how come uh, Israel does not become more secure? How come we hear from Mr. Netanyahu every day, you know, we have more enemies, now Iran is an enemy. There was not a single case when uh, there would be a proven link between terrorist activities against Israel and the Iranian government. Iran itself became a victim of Sunni, radical Sunni terrorism many times in the last at least 20 years. And we don't read it in the Western media. There was a terrible, uh, for example, there was a terrible terrorist attempt against the Israeli embassy in Lebanon. And that passed almost unnoticed in, in the United States. If a United States embassy was attacked somewhere in the Middle East, and, and, and there would be an explosion and a lot of people oh, would yeah. die. You can imagine, they would remember it until now, and, and they would avenge it until now. Okay, okay, let me go back to Athens here. Alex, uh, we saw the, the leading Democratic contenders for uh, the presidential sweepstakes. They basically divided uh, uh, on this issue of Omar. Uh, does that give you the uh, sense that this isn't going to go away because this is going to be used, this Omar story is going to be used as a wedge, and the issue of what is and is isn't anti-Semitic will continue. Go ahead, 40 seconds, Alex. Yeah, yeah, it, it'll be used as a wedge. And I think the Republicans and say the the conservative mainstream media, you know, they they should use it as a wedge. Not not because it's the right thing to do, but because on the other side of the spectrum, all you've been hearing for the past two years is Russia, 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 racist, racist, racist. And so you finally have now, you know, the, the Democrats kind of, you know, the shoes on the other foot now. And whether you believe she made anti-Semitic remarks or not, it is going to be used as a wedge issue. And I think the conservative media, Fox News, and the Republicans are going to use it as that. And they kind of, you know, have a right to do so, considering what the Democrats and the left well, have know, done to them for the past two years. Yeah, because I think what's interesting is that no one's actually talking about what she actually said is what they think was said here. That's all the time we have here. Yeah, so I think that's going to be one of the issues that uh the democratic candidates are going to be tearing themselves apart with during the uh, debates for the primaries that this issue isn't going to go away and you know we can probably look forward to uh omar um coming out with more and more comments uh like anti-israel comments because uh you know she she does have a point and a lot of people recognize that Israel is a terrorist state. It, you know, the way they've handled the the Palestinian people is just atrocious. And uh, I mean, just the inception of Israel is is just um, it was created under false pretenses by the British. Like the British, you know, they determined a lot of uh, you know uh, countries' boundaries and stuff like that. Uh, you know, post World War One, post World World War Two, you know. 
the their their empire, the British Empire, uh, you know, lasted for quite a while, and and they were running the world before before the United States became the global policeman. And we give Israel, I th- I'm pretty sure, over ten billion dollars. Uh, we we give them a lot of money. Uh, we give them the most out of any other country. And um, we should just leave them alone. We They have so much high-tech weaponry and everything in Israel. They can take care of themselves if they, you know, get attacked by terrorists or something like that. And, uh, you know, if we weren't as involved, they would, it, it would force them to, to try to be more diplomatic with the countries surrounding them. And maybe they wouldn't um, commit so many atrocities. But, uh, yeah, like like this guy started off with, uh, you know, this is the one thing he agrees with Omar with. Yeah, this is pretty much the one thing I agree with Omar with is uh, that, uh, you know, we need to stop uh, giving out so much aid to foreign countries, especially Israel, that we give so much to. Thank you, Alex, in uh, Athens. Uh, we're going to... Really, some story that broke today. The authorities are calling it the largest college admissions scam ever prosecuted by the Department of Justice. The actress, Felicity Huffman, and the actress, Lori Laughlin, are among those involved. There are 50 people or thereabouts indicted, CEOs, actors and actresses, coaches, college exam administrators, you name it, all charged in a nationwide cheating scandal. It involved wealthy individuals paying up to $6.5 million to place their children into elite universities. The judge joins us, Andrew Napolitano, Fox News Senior Judicial Analyst. It's kind of I don't know, unique, but different than what we've seen in the past because part of it was just paying someone to take a test for you, which I guess right. we have seen, obviously a crime. Right. But in other cases, you have bribes paid to coaches, so they take a slot for an athlete, and the person paying the bribe or the parent, they don't even have an athlete, so right. it doesn't pay the sport. What do you make right. of all this? Well, they, they, it, it's a serious crime because yeah. it's use of the mails and interstate wires to offer a fraudulent document. Right. This is a picture of my uh, child paying, playing soccer. It's the child's head, but somebody else's Yeah, the child body. doesn't even play soccer. Right. We're, here's my child's application. She got an 800 on the SAT score in, in literature. That's a perfect score, whereas in reality, she got something far less than that. Mm-hmm. So the, the evidence seems overwhelming. I was reading it this afternoon. Yeah. There, there are emails, there are texts, and there are phone conversations. This is a massive conspiracy, but it's one of those... Uh, conspiracies where not everybody knew each other. So right. the guy in the middle, think of it as the as the as a bicycle a wheel. The guy in the middle is the is the hub, and you have all these spokes going out. He knows everybody, but all the other conspirators don't know each right. other. Right, and in some, some cases, of the children, no doubt, they're not children anymore. No doubt, didn't know right. what their parents had done to get them in school. So and the schools innocent also, in, this. in many cases, are saying at least, and it, 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 I, I would think it's believable. Maybe the schools didn't know. So if you bribe a coach, this in Yale, this is an example that's in the indictment. There's a soccer coach who's now resigned. I guess we know why. At right. Yale, women's soccer coach, they give him a four hundred thousand dollar bribe. He gets a girl in to be on his team who doesn't even play soccer. But the school's just going to claim, hey, we didn't know about they this. We thought this it. was one of his recruits. Well, guess should what? they have There's, known? Yes. The school has a duty to know the integrity involved or the absence thereof in the admission of the students. So that's the next step in all this. Correct. Correct. Uh, how about uh, these kids that have graduated and some have gone to law school and medical school? Right. Are their undergraduate degrees defective? What if they didn't know, though? Does it matter? I, I doubt that any, anyone will harm a hair on the head of the students who were innocent in all this. And right. in fact, the government has chosen, as far as I can tell, one of the documents is 300 pages long. The government has not indicted any of the students. Yeah. They've indicted the people who received the money and the people who paid the money. And one other question. We have one other topic. One other question on this. What if a student didn't get in? Say, uh, in that Yale example. Right. Because they some, were bumped by somebody who's right. There's right. only a certain amount of slots. And the student says, well, the coach told me in an email that I was good enough to be on the team, but he didn't have any slots left. Do yeah. they have any recourse? Th- they might. It would depend on where they went to school and whether they prospered nevertheless and what the difference would have been. So it's a difficult case yeah. Uh, yeah. Difficult case to prove. I didn't get into Yale, but I got into Harvard. <laughs> what are your damages? Oh, Waiting for Melissa to come. Melissa's <laughs> well, just, uh, she's happy that, that Harvard wasn't involved in this. Yes. And, uh, you know, yes. And, and where I went at Fordham, we just, that we don't even have the motivation to get involved. Now, um, I did want to ask you. Well, well there is a Jesuit school involved. Uh, Georgetown. Georgetown, I right, saw that. Bitter and arch rival. I saw that.
that. Well, <laughs> I want to ask you about Elon Musk before we let you go, because that case is also uh, pending. In fact, there was just a development. A judge just granted. Yeah, so um, that's just uh, it's not surprising, but it's, it's, it is incredible that um, if you're a kid that grew up uh, in such a lucky situation, uh, that your your parent your mom's an actress you got millions of dollars yet still need a millions spent just to get you into this college like come on now I mean I think they would have been all right if they ended up at a community college you know I think they would have been all right it wouldn't have been the end of the world I heard that two of the the daughters of one of the actresses uh, dropped from whatever college they they were going to, but that's just it's yeah. I I hope they uh, I hope they um, you know get get fined, get arrested, get thrown in jail, whatever the the consequences, whatever the proper consequences. Like that's uh, I mean, it sounded like it was a, a felony because you said that. They were sending money across state borders or something like that. If uh, the crime involves going from state to state, it could be a, it's a felony, and that's serious prison time. And uh, they deserve whatever they whatever is coming to them because, you know, college has become enough of a scam already. Uh, you know, in a lot of people's eyes, because they charge so damn much. And uh, now to learn about this kind of action going on you gotta you know really question what it is you're paying what it is you're paying for right. the sec kill in the investigation and takedown of this case the takedown today involved over 200 federal agents nationwide who arrested 50 people in six states and on both coasts with that, I'll hand things over to Joe Bonavolonta, who is the special agent in charge of the Boston office of the FBI. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Once again, my name is Joe Bonavolonta, and I'm the special agent in charge of the FBI Boston Division. Operation Varsity Blues culminated early this morning when approximately 300 special agents from the FBI and the IRS criminal investigations set out to arrest 46 individuals across the country for their roles in an international college admissions bribery and money laundering scam. So far, 38 individuals have been safely taken into custody and seven are working towards surrender. One is being actively pursued. Another four are expected to plead guilty here in Boston, two later today, and two in the coming weeks. We believe all of them, parents, coaches, and facilitators, lied, cheated, and covered up their crimes at the expense of hardworking students and taxpayers everywhere. Our investigation began last May after we uncovered evidence of a large-scale elaborate fraud while working in unrelated undercover operation. Following 10 months of intense investigative efforts using a variety of sophisticated techniques, the FBI uncovered what we believe is a rigged system, robbing students all over the country of their right at a fair shot to getting into some of the most elite universities in this country, such as Yale, Stanford, and Georgetown. We believe everyone charged here today had a role in fostering a culture of corruption and greed that created an uneven playing field for students trying to get into these schools the right way through hard work, good grades, and community service. Unfortunately, what many students didn't know was that the odds had already been stacked against them by corrupt practices, including but not limited to bribery, falsification of athletic profiles and near perfect SAT and ACT scores that were fraudulently obtained on behalf of other students when in reality they were far from perfect. Make no mistake, this is not a case where parents were acting in the best interests of their children. This is a case where they flaunted their wealth, sparing no expense to cheat the system so, so they could set their children up 
for success with the best education money could buy, literally. Some, Some spent anywhere from 200000 to $6.5 million dollars for guaranteed admission. Their, Their actions were, without a doubt, doubt insidious, selfish, and shameful. And the, and the real victims in this case are the hardworking students. students. So, like, I've seen on Twitter, like, a lot of people say, like, oh, this is an example of white privilege. Like, no, this is an example of uh, rich privilege, of having a lot of money, um, you know, uh, wealth is not exclusive to one race. Uh, the, you know, like, this is clearly just uh, people who have a lot of money and, you know, they... Yeah, you can kind of see from their perspective, like, you know, they want the best for their kids, but, um, you know, and, and, and I'm sure that they get a lot of pressure within their own social circles, like, oh... Well, my my son went to Harvard. Where did your son go to? Oh, my went to Wesleyan. Oh, well, I hear Wesleyan. Why not? Yeah. You know. But I, you know, I I hope I hope they they uh they catch more people. I'm sure this is a lot. I'm sure this is a very common thing. Um, there definitely needs to be some accountability going on here because this kind of shit just uh it, it gives the colleges a bad name and you know you're just putting a bunch of people who you know falsify their intelligence their knowledge and then they're going out into the world as lawyers and doctors and you know it's you're gonna be fucking other people's lives over if you if you you just handing out degrees to people who haven't earned it did everything they could there's a recent report by the US Center for Disease Control that reveals that deaths in America due to alcohol drugs and suicide is even higher than ever the numbers have continued to go up each and every year but the biggest jump was especially with men uh, suicide has definitely gone up and opioid deaths, which have increased by a whopping tenfold in just the past five years. Some of the biggest increases were seen in the South and in the Rust Belt states like Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Pulitzer Prize winning author Chris Hedges addresses this problem in his book, The Farewell Tour. I ask him why this is happening. It's because uh, these people feel trapped. Uh, they feel their lives are stagnant. Uh, they recognize that there's no uh, way that they can actualize themselves, uh, both in terms of meaningful work and economically. Uh, they recognize that there's no way out for their children. Uh, and so they are attempting to anesthetize themselves and, and this despair, this desperation, what the sociologist Emile Durkheim called anomie, uh, by engaging in self-destructive forms of behavior, uh, whether that is through alcoholism, the opioid crisis, hate groups. I mean, it's important. Durkheim, when he writes his book on suicide, about what it is that drives individuals and communities to carry out acts of self-destruction, says that those who engage in extremist forms of hate are really, really driven by a desire for self-annihilation. Uh, and I think until we address this social inequality, this social dislocation uh, that has shunted aside at this point well over half of the American working poor, you will see these kind of pathologies become more and more pronounced. This, they are responding to the fact that they have, in, in, at least in their eyes, been discarded as, as, as human refuse. Uh, and I think they're not wrong. We have created an oligarchic system. Uh, income inequality is now at the highest levels in American history. Uh, and, you know, there is a breaking point. Uh, you, you know, remember, as Darber Ehrenreich says in Nickel and Dime, uh, being poor, part of the working poor in America is one long emergency. Because when your old car that you can't afford to get fixed breaks down, you can't get to work, then you lose your job, then you can't pay your rent. And finally, uh, it's understandable that you engage in some kind of activity to blunt the pain. And that's what we're seeing. 
and it's getting worse. It's not getting better. Is the recourse a change in the political system? And is that the reason that most of the people that you just described adore Donald Trump? Well, the, the reason people adore Donald Trump, first of all, they're white. So they're part of that white working class uh, that was more susceptible to the myth of the American dream. Uh, and Baldwin writes that African Americans don't have that susceptibility because uh, from the moment they are children, they understand there's two sets of rules, one for them and one for us. Uh, but they're the white working class. And, and so, yes, they are finding in Trump a figure who expresses their rage at the established elites in both parties, whether it's the Bushes or the Clintons. It's a bit of a generalization as there are uh, quite a bit of uh, Trump supporters that are people of color. That sold them out, and they're not wrong. Uh, and so uh, Trump may be vulgar and crude and even vile, but he is expressing, I would argue, a legitimate rage towards these elites that uh, under the uh, ideology of neoliberalism, has fleeced the country and destroyed their lives. And that's, that's the attraction. Even if he is one of them and is not necessarily enacting policy. He's, he's totally right, though. Um, you know, even from personal experience, it's, you know, when you're going through stress of uh, losing a job or um, working at a job that you hate, but you just continue doing it to pay bills, you know, it's... It, it's easy to look at a substance or something like that as a as a band-aid to kind of just forget what's going on even though you know the more responsible way is to just to, to deal with that problem to find a different job or to find a job or you know uh, start exercising or meditation or stuff like that but you know, when you live in America and, and there's all these uh, things available to you to blunt your pain, uh, you know, I can I can see how that happens. But then there's there's those that even that's not enough. And, you know, uh, that's why we see suicide higher, even though unemployment is down. Uh, you know, people are, are there's definitely people that are underpaid you know that's what you would call like the under underemployed like whatever job they're working isn't giving them enough money uh, because dollar has inflated so much that you know you need to make uh, you know like for example in new york city you need to make like sixty thousand dollars a year to be like full be able to fully sustain yourself and you know that's what you, you would call the living wage is a wage that you're able to have an apartment and uh you know, uh, be able to eat out when you want, go on vacation when you want, maybe even have a car or something to get around. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that, that live l with less than that, that just scrounge to survive. And um, it's tough living like that. People don't like to live like that. Especially when you see people walking up and down, living, you know, that, that uh, you know are able to pay their bills on time and able to have a nice apartment and all these things and you know it's it's not easy policies that will get them out of the hole they're in well of course he's a con artist but uh the point is that they don't trust the established media uh and why should they um the established media has been a handmaiden of corporate power and is owned and dominated by corporate power. So in many ways he's protected uh, because when they turn on CNN and watch Wolf Blitzer, who by the way used to work for APAC, um, they know that they're invisible. Their concerns are invisible, their lives are invisible, their suffering is invisible, what's been done to them is invisible, and it's just the chattering of courtiers sitting around Versailles uh, talking about Stormy Daniels or who tweeted what, or, which is utterly irrelevant to their existence. So a political change is the only thing that will, and perhaps even a revolutionary political change, is the only thing that will truly bring some type of salvation to our current condition, at least in the minds of how most Americans who are committing suicide, doing drugs, and getting drunk see it. Right. Either they're reintegrated into the economy and given uh, a, a place within that system, one where they can have dignity and respect, 
I'll, I'll tell you, the best encyclical on work written by any pope was written by John Paul II, um, hardly a, a, a raving left winger, uh, but he got it. Uh, work is more than about the exchanging of labor for a wage. Uh, it, it is vitally important to our uh, place within the society, our mental health, our, uh, our emotional health. Um, and when you take that away, um, these are the consequences that you get. So either these people are reintegrated economically, and let me go back to Rabin. Uh, Yitzhak Rabin in Israel, when he signed the peace agreement with Oslo, understood that the way to break fanaticism among the Palestinians was to give them a place in the Israel economy, the Israeli economy, so that Ahmed could go to Tel Aviv and buy a refrigerator and, and send his kids to school and have hope. In essence, that's really what this system has done. It has taken away the possibility of hope, and if we don't restore it, things are going to get exponentially worse. So the formula for calculating economic growth is pretty So this one might be a little tough to get through because it this involves math, but um, this is explaining how the growth in military spending under the U.S. president has helped to stimulate the economy, economy and boost GDP, but um, also it, I think, gives you some other kind of information that shows why the GDP has gone up and it's not necessarily what you think. Wait, okay, so gross domestic product is consumption plus investment plus government expenditure plus net exports. We're not going to go into too much detail here because today we just care about government expenditures. You can divide up government expenditures even further. You've got state and local or federal expenditures, and then within federal expenditures, you have defense and non-defense. Defense is military spending, things that go boom. That's what we care about today. So what you're looking at right now is contributions from federal defense spending to annual GDP growth. The GDP growth number should not be important in American politics because there are better ways to measure how we're doing, but it is. That's just the world as is given to us. Every White House gets measured on how high they can get that number. Can you get it to three? Can you get it to four percent? So when we take a look at the contribution that defense makes, it's easy to see a pattern. This right here, right after 2001, is the ramp up in federal defense spending after September 11th. Then we see again during the recession there's nothing else happening. We don't have a lot of consumption. We don't have a lot of investment. It's government spending is all there is, really, right? So it becomes uh, the only mainstay in a stimulus. Then something happens. Two things together, in fact. This right here is the Obama administration winding down wars in the Middle East. But at the same time, it's having a fight with Congress that results in a sequester. kind of crammed it in there, but a sequester is basically a terrible arrangement where you decide that to force yourselves to get along, you're going to make very painful cuts to the military and some other discretionary kinds of funding. So they're stuck. They lift the caps on the sequester from year to year, but not by a lot. So what we're looking at right here is that defense spending is a net drag on economic growth. Now, I'm not a defense policy analyst. I can't say whether that's a good idea or a bad idea. I can tell you that that has an effect on this number, GDP growth, that presidents get judged by. Something happens here. In the last year, Congress has lifted the caps, particularly on defense spending, by a lot. So now you have a positive contribution uh, to GDP growth. It's no longer a drag when we're looking at that number. It's actually even more dramatic when you look at the quarterly numbers. So if you have second quarter of last year, Whiz bang, 4.2%. That's an amazing number. The administration made a big deal out of it, rightly so. We hadn't seen it in a while. The contribution of defense spending in that quarter to GDP growth was 0.22 percentage points. Take that away, make it a drag like we did a couple years ago, and you don't get to 4%. So this is a big deal. In theory, the Republican Party in the United States doesn't like to stimulate the economy through government expenditures. They prefer consumption and investment coming from the private sector. But there is one exception. It's what we're looking at right here, defense spending. Barney Frank is a retired congressman from uh, Massachusetts. He's a Democrat. He used to call this
weaponized Keynesianism. Keynesianism, not a philosophy that Republicans in the United States traditionally adhere to, but it basically says in times of great need, you need to step in as the government and spend a lot of money to make up for all that private consumption and private investment that has disappeared. What we have happening right now is what we have happening right now. Yeah, so basically that's a chart that um, shows the GDP growth from um, the Obama administration to the, the Trump administration. So GDP is global domestic product. That is basically like a rating of like how well your economy is, is, is going. So the reason why, uh, you know, the GDP went up is because Trump spent a whole bunch of money on the military, kept dumping more money into the military, and that raised the GDP. So it wasn't that like, oh, uh, you know, small businesses are on the rise and hiring more people or, the, you know, things like that. No, it's just that, you know, the, the big... The, the huge uh, military industrial complex companies and everything they that line the pockets of the politicians they got some more money and then the politicians got more money and you know eventually through camp campaign funding so that's why the economy got better uh you know well the gdp got better i wouldn't say the economy got better like i'm ha i'm still struggling to find a job i've been struggling for several months to find a good job like a, now I'm starting to just apply everywhere because, like, I need to fucking pay bills. And um, Keynesianism in general is not it's not a good economic policy. Like he said, it's about spending money to generate more money. Um, you know, we should, especially now that we are $22 trillion in debt, we need to uh, pay down the debt. The government needs to stop spending so much on 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 the military especially but a lot of different things but mostly the military needs to be drastically cut it's the expenditure stupid should be the line not it's the deficit stupid so this is just a a, inform, a quick info video that talks about um national debt and government spending and why we should why we shouldn't why the government should spend less. And this is uh, Jeff Myron uh, from Harvard University. My name is Jeff Myron. I'm Director of Undergraduate Studies in the Department of Economics at Harvard University. I want to talk about deficits, debt, and the U.S. fiscal situation. First, what is the deficit? It's the difference between how much we spend and how much we take in in tax revenue. Our debt is how much we accumulate over time from running deficits year after year. It's basically the sum of our past deficits. The U.S. situation is such that we're running huge deficits, we're projected to run huge deficits, and therefore our debt is exploding and is going to eventually crash over time. We will end up being bankrupt and having to default on all their debt. Now what should we do about this? Lots of people say, well, we should raise some taxes and cut some spending. There's two problems with that. First of all, raising taxes slows the economy down. That means less tax revenue, and that makes the problem even worse, okay, because we're not going to be as vibrant an economy, and so our deficits will tend to be even bigger, despite having raised taxes, because of the slower economic growth. Second, that approach forgets the fact that most of the expenditure, huge amounts, are a terrible idea to begin with. We don't want most of that expenditure. It's all been put there by special interest group. So even if we had a huge surplus, we should still be cutting an enormous fraction of federal expenditure. And that's the huge problem. It's the expenditure stupid should be the line, not it's the deficit stupid. Why is spending bad in and of itself? It's bad because, first of all, that spending is money that could have been in the private sector. It is spending that could have been done by a private business or an individual on something that they thought was productive or useful or valuable. So we're making decisions about that spending in Washington instead of out there in the country by individuals. But in addition, that spending is distorting all of the ways that resources are allocated. By spending money to subsidize health insurance, we're encouraging people to buy too much health care. 
that's really bad for the efficiency of the healthcare system. By spending money trying to enforce drug prohibition, we're creating crime and corruption. That's really bad for the economy. And the list goes on and on, with few exceptions, such as, say, some of national defense, spending causes tons of problems because it interferes in the workings of private markets. So I think that's probably the best explanation you can get in two minutes as to why we need to cut um, spending. Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. This is the Kaiser Report. You know, you can't taper a Ponzi scheme. We've been saying that for quite some time. More evidence just in. Let's turn to Stacy Herbert and get the latest. Max, we've seen the evidence pouring in. It looks like despite the soaring stock markets in the United States this year, at least, uh, maybe other places didn't have the same, um, that they actually cannot taper the Ponzi. They've been trying to pretend that they can taper only so that they can unwind it. We saw that um, in Europe, they're announcing more quantitative easing. The Fed in the United States is indicating that uh, they're considering negative rates should anything ever go bad again. But, you know, here's an image that really put the fear of God in me, and that is Powell, Yellen, and Bernanke, current ch Fed chair, former, and then the previous one to her. Powell's 60-minute message to stress Fed independence and efforts to support average American. Yes, their policies, just so you know, and just so you don't come with the pitchforks when the next round of negative rates comes. They're doing this for your own good. Well, uh, you may recall that Ben Bernanke, while he was the chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank, made the comment that, yeah, we're doing all this quantitative easing. Uh, in other words, they're buying back the bonds that they sell. Uh, but we can reverse ourselves in 15 minutes. It's not debt monetization like you might find in some, quote, banana republic, where they just buy back all the debt that they sell. No, no, it's quantitative easing because it's temporary. Uh, what they've said this week, and I guess the why all three of these Fed chairmen, current and post, are on or past are on uh, 60 Minutes, are because they've now come to the realization that they have been monetizing debt, that the U.S. dollar is grossly overinflated, that it is in a bubble, uh, that it will pop, and they are preparing for the backlash. They are preparing for the ugly backlash. So here, I'm going to say also, in the past week, what we've seen, I'm going to show you two tweets, which indicate perhaps all is not right behind the scenes. On the surface, it all looks sunny and fun and, and warm and cuddly, and house prices are rising and stock prices are rising, except for the huge down days. <laughs> Feds William says, in a downturn, we could consider quantitative easing, negative rates, and then that was, uh, you know, the United States Federal Reserve Bank. And then a tweet from the ECB, Draghi, negative rates have been quite successful, he said. He believes negative rates have been successful so far in helping the European economy. When the um, European Central Bank, Draghi, mentioned this, I will say this is the stock 600 bank shares. They plummeted. So um, I don't think investors were happy to hear this from the European Central Bank. No, um, bank stocks and, you know, since the era of Reagan, you know, the financialization of the economy has become the dominant theme in global economics. So we're post manufacturing, you know, we entered into just a bank Ponzi scheme economy globally that requires continuous money printing as any Ponzi scheme does. So this idea of negative interest rates is the admission that uh, simply printing money is not enough to keep the Ponzi scheme going. They have to confiscate money. They have to confiscate money from people's accounts. The negative interest rates is coming to your bank account soon. It's being done on the wholesale level right now between countries, but now it's gonna come to your local bank account. So instead of getting 30 basis points on your money market fund or on your savings account at the bank, you'll get negative 3%. So that 3% will be taken out of your account and given to someone that the central bank says is systemically important. So if you, you said, oh my God, that sounds like medievalism. That sounds like the old church uh, tithing from folks be, to appease God. Yes, uh, they believe they are gods. That's why they justify stealing 
So this is new, this is neo-feudalism now we're entering into. Well, I'm not sure about the gods. Certainly, uh, Lloyd Blankfein mentioned that he was doing God's work. Nevertheless, he's no longer there. But what we have is a system that is rigged against the ordinary person. Uh, here they are telling you they're doing it for your own good. Uh, this is what abusive parents also often say when they're uh, abusing their children, is they say they're doing it for their own good. Yellen, Bernanke, and Powell went on to 60 Minutes, on to national television here in America, and they said that we're going to be doing something for your own good. Get ready for it. So they're basically giving the banks warning that what's coming, and the banks are happy. The banks should be happy. They're, they're going to do well. But for the ordinary person, you should buy Bitcoin, gold, and silver, I think, you know, because you need to protect yourself because they are already signaling to the world what they're about to do and that there are bad debts that we don't know about that haven't been made transparent. Again, when everything is on a blockchain that is uh, immutable and you can't uh, hide your fraud, this sort of behavior will not be allowed. But I want to turn to another tweet yeah. about what's going on with the European Central Bank and European banks. So, you know, the, the European Central Bank started late with their quantitative easing compared to America. They started a few years afterward. But here's a tweet saying that European banks have been buying EU government bonds again. They've even been making the purchases using the cheap loans extended to them by the ECB, the ones intended to spur lending to anyone or anything other than governments. When they're telling you that this is for your own good, ordinary Joe bag of donuts citizen out there, we're, we're giving all this free money to banks for your own good. And they say what, how it's supposed to be for your own good is that this is going to stimulate the economy. It's going to encourage companies to borrow and invest in production and the future and you and your wages. But over and over, they just continue to lend to governments because, of, gov of course, governments are the safe bet because they could just print more money and tax you, the citizen who hasn't been a beneficiary of any of this money printing. Okay, the, the term for this is debt monetization. So, okay, if I had a store and uh, I borrowed money from the bank to buy everything in my store, uh, how long would that be successful? How long would that, could I be in business, that, that, that business model? I borrow money, I pay the bank interest, and I buy everything in my store. So I don't sell anything. I make no profits. I'm just borrowing money to buy my own store. Okay? The central bank is borrowing money from each other to buy their own debt. They say they're lending money to business to create economic activity, to stimulate aggregate demand. But that's false. They offer this credit out to, to the market, and they say, who wants credit? Who wants to be in business? Who wants to be a millionaire? And, the, and Jamie Dimon says, I want it, I want it. So as we saw with MF Global, that scandal, he simply walks in, breaks every known law on the books, takes the money, whoosh, puts it in a bank account and say, I'm a genius. Okay, well, by that measure, anyone who's robbed a bank is a genius. Anyone who's robbed a convenience store is a genius by that measure. But it's also smoke and mirrors and you don't know who's lying to you, but they're lying to you. It's, a, it's, a, it, it's, it's like a... A, a magic show, right? They're pretending, um, oh, we're, we're helping you, the ordinary citizen, out, we the central banks. And we are independent. We're not doing anything to help the governments or the bankers. And yet, time after time, it seems to just help the governments and the bankers. And it's, it, it's, a, it's a charade, right? It's a charade. It's like, it's fake. It's like, why are they giving the money to the bankers who then lend it to the governments? Why cut out, why, why use that middleman? So they don't have to pretend it's an entirely command and control monetary system. But, but it's they more insidious than that because yeah. I believe it was you who pointed out that there's separation between church and state in America. Yeah. And the central banks have set themselves up as a church, have set themselves up as a religion. Well, so explain this further. We, um, this will be coming up in a new series we have called To the Moon. And we had a conversation with Nozomi Hayes. And in that conversation, we talk about the separation of church and state. And what has happened now is we have no separation between the church of the Federal Reserve Bank and the bankers, i.e. they have a divine right to continue to exist. Only they have a divine right. You must be subject to the laws of nature. And that is, um, you know, creative destruction. You, if you have a bad business idea, you fail. 
um, these guys have bad bets and they succeed over and over. That's my point about neo-feudalism. Okay, under feudalism, you had the monarchy. You gave to the monarchs who justified it by being divinely in, uh, endowed. Right? Then you had separation of church and state. Then you had the Enlightenment. Then you had the Constitution. Then you had the American ex uh, experiment. Okay, now the central banks are saying that all the American experiment failed. We are gods. We are a part of a this market fundamentalism. Definitely, definitely it's a post-enlightenment. It's a pre-enlightenment sort of time, and uh, only certain well, people... Well, neo-feudalism. Uh, feudalism is yeah. what they... The economic model before at that time was called feudalism. And so yeah. this is a neo-feudalism. Yeah, and it's, uh, but I like the, I prefer the word sort of divine, that they have some sort of, they're endowed with special privileges and rights above and beyond. Well, that's a monarch's that nine, The monarchs believe they yeah. were, the Queen Elizabeth yeah. thinks she's given power by God, right? I mean, that's what a monarch thinks. In terms of Europe, of course, you know, the central bank says, I'm, I'm printing this money, we're printing this money, and we're giving it to the banks, and they're going to lend it to companies, and the, the economy is going to grow. But in fact, what happens is they give it to the, the government, and the reason is because of the, um, the regulations about their tier one capital, and no, basically, there's nowhere for them to put it but to government. So, you know, this is part of that weird neoliberal claptrap, which... They, they all say they're just following the rules. The algorithm says we have to put it there. Um, we would lend it to you, <laughs> Joe Bag of Donuts, out there. But you know what? You're not credit worthy, even though our free money is coming from your good credit, essentially, as a nation and as a people. Right. And speaking of Tier 1 Capital, and this is set by the Bank of International Settlements, and the latest Basel agreement kicks in on March 29th. And in this new iteration, gold, is considered to be a um, reserve asset for the first time in many, many years. So now gold is back essentially in play. Gold is now a reserve currency for the first time in decades. That's why China, Russia, and these other countries have been aggressively buying gold. And now we're back on a gold standard. I know people won't cover this on CNBC or other news outlets, but the gold standard effectively is, as of the end of this month is back. Well, the BIS used to not count foreign currency exchange, the reserves. They only counted gold. So now they're, it looks like, yeah, we're coming back to that. I, I saw Jim Rickards, we'll say, in the last few moments here. But uh, he was saying that, you know, the U.S. in terms of their debt ceiling debate coming up again, um, because now we're over $21 trillion in debt, is our gold reserves, the 8,000 tons, are still valued on the books at $44 an ounce. Obviously, it's $1,300 an ounce, but he's saying, like, one way to get to avoid this, um, you know, the showdown in Congress about the debt ceiling is just to revalue it at $100 an ounce instead of, you know, so you double the ability of your government to borrow. Right, that's what they'll do. To reduce debt uh, percentage to GDP, they'll simply say, okay, gold is now uh, higher than $44 an ounce. And um, so the gold standard is, is back. And we've been saying about this for, for years. Okay, we got to take a break. When we come back, much. All right. Um... So what they were talking about with negative rates um, is kind of scary. So if you have a savings account, they're going to start taking money out instead of giving you interest. Ah, oh, man. But the thing is, we got to get rid of the Federal Reserve. We've got to abolish the Federal Reserve. Um, we just pulled up an article during that video. Uh, says uh, This is from 2018, December 23rd. Uh, Trump now realizes he can't fire Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell. Um, and the Federal Reserve, they determine uh, what the dollar is worth. They can print money. Um, the tr U.S. Treasury doesn't print their own money as it should. Uh, the Federal Reserve does. And um, the, the big banks have been uh, running the economy since uh, the 1913 crash uh, that began the Great Depression. I believe. And... Uh, the bus on the banks I think that's when the Federal Reserve Federal Reserve yeah Federal Reserve Act 
So the Federal Reserve wasn't always a part of the United States. Uh, wasn't always didn't always exist. Uh, you know, it was basically our central bank um, that came into effect in December twenty third, nineteen thirteen. Uh, the Federal Reserve Act is an act of Congress that created the Federal Reserve System and central banking system of the United States, and which created the authority to issue Federal Reserve notes as legal tender. So before that. Um, the U.S. Treasury um, printed the, the dollar. The Federal Reserve Act created a system of private and public entities. And they're not a completely public thing. It, it's mostly private. It's it's um, There were to be at least eight and no more than 12 private regional federal banks, Federal Reserve Banks. There's a group of banks runs the Federal Reserve. <coughs> so... It, you know, contract of uh, conflict of interest, right? You got these uh, a group of big banks. They they they're in charge of the dollar, of how much it's worth, and you know uh, how much goes into circulation and all that. So, uh, I definitely recommend researching the Federal Reserve if you you ha you know if you if you don't know too much about it or you haven't heard of it, definitely look into that. Uh, next video. This is actually kind of. Actually, kind of funny. This this uh, live streamer that I follow um, took a trip to Mexico, and he just so happened to catch some people uh, crossing the border. <laughs> oh, 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 shit! Look, look. Hey, I do nothing. I do nothing. Hey, hey, I do nothing, cut. Content. Content, dude. And this was actually on the news. Um, I could show that video too, but this this is the full video of well. Well, it's it's still this one's still a highlight as well, but it it shows more than the video that they show on the news. What's going on here? And also, the guys are all the way over there, right over there. I'm pointing at right there. You walk downstairs like an old fat woman who just had hip surgery. I just had a hip surgery, bro. What do you mean? Yeah, let's see what's going on over there, look. There's a whole group right there, bro. Is that the caravan? Oh shit! Well, part of the caravan. Not everybody, but. Oh, hell no. Bro, people are trying to climb the wall. What is this guy doing? Oh, no. Bro, that's a whole, literally a whole caravan here, dude. I think the whole members or something. Oh, look. They're coming, dude. Dude, they're all coming. What the fuck? Chat, what's going on? Dude, everybody's coming downstairs all of a sudden. What the fuck is this? Chat, what is this? What's going on here? Bro, coverage is coming out here. Look what it is doing. Fake news. Fake news. Fake news. They're all coming here all of a sudden. In fact, people right there. Oh, dude, there's something good. Something. This could be some potential content here. Well, chat, I went to Mexico. I don't know where today. And this is some CX news right here. CX news. CX news. CX news out here. Give me the news here. Don't mind me. This is CX news. What is this? This. Chat, this scripted. Chat, this is scripted. Like, they all came out of nowhere and, like, they're taking a picture. Is this scripted here? What the fuck? Oh, hell no. Bro, they all just came out of nowhere. What the? Where's everybody coming from? Chat, where's everybody coming from? I see a fucking horse there. What? Chat, oh. Something can happen here. Some, something can some, something can happen here, chat. Oh, I came at the right time. Look, why is there a horse there now? There's a horse right there. Giddy out, giddy out. Oh, crap. Chat, more people coming. What is going on here? Chat, there's more people coming here. What the fuck? Oh no, they're doing something. Oh no, here it comes. Bro, they might fight shots or something. I hope not. Bro, she's trying to get in. Bro, she's try she trying to get in, bro. Yeah. Bro, she's trying to get in. Are you kidding me? Look, it's on first. Chat, somebody's trying to get in, bro. Chat. So, one guy was saying, like, oh, you gotta open it from the bottom. Uh. Some other guy was saying, oh, we're all going to fit through. Uh, someone said, I need, I need scissors or something. Chad, what the fuck are you doing? Chad, this is content. This, this is content overload. What is going on? I literally just tuned in out of nowhere. 
What the fuck's going on here, chat? They want to break the wall. Oh, look, somebody put it. Chat, look, somebody put it in there. Chat, look. Chat, you're doing nice. Chat, 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 look. Chat. Chat, this is content. English? Spanish? English. What the fuck is going on here? I literally just got here in the beach and this happens out of nowhere. What? Like literally just relaxing, all this happens. What? Six news, six news. this footage. Chat, if the news take this shit, make sure to watermark this video. It doesn't matter what red is coming from, watermark this video. Please, try to make sure you watermark the video. Jesus Christ. I can't believe this just fucking happened. Hi, Poseidon. This is why you should have cable. He's on the news. Some folks made a dash for the U.S. border from the other side. Bro, they crossed the wall. They crossed the border. They crossed the border. Chat, they crossed the border. A run for the border caught on camera. It's crazy. I didn't know this would happen on live stream. Video shows groups of migrants breach the wall. I see all these caravan members. I'm like, whoa, what's going on? And they all gather around. YouTuber Andy Martin was live streaming in Tijuana Thursday afternoon when it all went down. And they all have like a like a scissor and they start like cutting the fence thing off. I'm like, wait, what's going on? Mexican Andy, as he's known online, says it was shocking to witness. And then they cut it and people just start running. I'm like, why is this guy running for? 
it looked painful because like one of them were, were like overweight so one of them actually managed to get in i'm like oh that's gotta hurt and they ran I'm like oh they're all just running martin says the lone agent at the fence could only do so much before radioing for support i think it did overwhelm i mean they couldn't do anything but then the border patrol had to call for backup and they had like all bunch of like three atvs or whatever they're called they have those I think they stopped all of them. Border Patrol says two separate groups rushed the border at the same time Thursday. Agents arrested 53 people and do not believe anyone got away. For me, it was sad because we're, we're the young people running with kids in there, with the mom, with the kids, you know. Annalena Duarte was rolling on the incident from Mexico and says she has a feeling we're going to see more of this. Everybody from uh, South America and they communicate and come more and more and strike crossing every time. So I don't think it is uh, going to stop. Something is the government have to do. At the border, Travis Rice, 10 News. Yeah, so basically, like I said in the previous episode, the way to stop people from coming, from crossing illegally is to stop offering welfare and stuff to illegal immigrants. And, uh, you know, then they they would then only the ones that are willing to work uh, would come, just like it always has been. You know, but uh, since we offer welfare and stuff, like just, like more more people want to want to come through. You know, that's why they bring in their kids and stuff. Usually, illegal immigration was limit was really just um, working age men that would would cross to in, in order to uh, make money to send back to Mexico. Corey said, Corey asked, where, where are they coming from? Sweden? Corey says, fuck the police. And he also says, I can't wait until America is all brown. Well, it'll probably take a while for, um, like, a vi like I've, I've, I've seen that, like a video or something that said that in the, f in the future, eventually everybody will be mixed race. Um, you know, probably like in a thou couple thousand years or something like that. And just like this is okay. This is the wait. What is this? This isn't part of my thing. Oh yeah, because I went off. I went off to a different. Yeah. Sorry. Hold on a second. Okay, back on track. Is it possible that a cell phone tower that is right smack in the middle of an elementary school, think about that, we're going to show it to you here in just a minute, that that cell phone tower is putting out enough radiation to harm the students in that school that have to walk by it every day, right? Well, get this, four students at this school have now come down with cancer. And both parents and some experts are saying the cell phone tower is to blame. What is really going on here? Well, we sent RT's Natasha Sweet to find out. A fourth child has been diagnosed with cancer at a San Joaquin County elementary school. Parents are outraged and believe a particular cell phone tower is to blame. While cell phone towers are spread throughout the area, experts are suggesting a cell phone tower on campus is responsible for an astounding four cases of cancer among kids. Monica Ferrelli says her 10-year-old son Mason was the second child at Weston Elementary diagnosed with cancer. According to Mason's doctor, the cancer is purely environmental. He reportedly has been walking past this very tower every day for three years. Kyle Prime was the first diagnosed with kidney cancer in 2016. Now, two other children were diagnosed this year. The district sent out a letter to parents claiming the electric magnetic frequencies are far below federal standards. But parents weren't sold and hired their own EMF specialist who found the radiation exposure to be significantly higher than what the district claimed. Eric Winheim said, I wouldn't send my kids there at all. It absolutely is dangerous. Children are still developing and their cells are 
are still being divided. It's the worst possible time in their life to be exposed. Parents are calling for the removal of this cell phone tower, but the district says after a thorough investigation, they have no plans to take it down. In Los Angeles, Natasha Sweet, RT. I'm Rick Sanchez. Yeah, we talked about uh, this recently too, well more about 5G, the dangers of 5G, but um, I'm assuming that cell phone tower is you know, probably just a regular 4G in this story, but they still cause damage, even the 4G towers, um, because they disrupt our, our biochemistry, uh, you know, these electromagnetic ra radiations, you, you know, uh, waves and, and uh, that, that magnet, you know, the magnetism, the le electrical, you know, waves, we, you know, our body has electricity in it. You know, uh, that's why that's why in the Matrix, it's it's scary to think that we could be used as batteries because it's true. We could be used as batteries if, uh, if there was some kind of like cyborg robot ent entity that wanted to harvest uh, human energy. So uh, even though we don't see the waves, they, they do affect us just like as if you hopped in a microwave. Uh, you wouldn't see the microwaves tearing your your atoms apart and frying you up. According to some members of the U.S. Congress, Trump is just not hard enough on Russia. New legislation is required. The U.S. House of Representatives just passed four bills specifically targeting Russia. They are mandating that no federal agency actually recognize Crimea as being part of Russia. Furthermore, they are demanding that the intelligence agency dig into Vladimir Putin and his family's assets. But that is just the tip of the iceberg. Resolution condemns the Putin regime. We speak out against strong men and dictators. We will sanction them. Oppose strict sanctions. Oppose sanctions. Expose. Condemn. Reveal. And they must be brought to account for their actions. Anyone who has ever watched mainstream media has heard that whole Trump-Putin mantra. But just in case you missed it, why is he such a wuss on Russia? President Trump has had nothing but kind words to say for Vladimir Putin. He's surrendering to Putin's worldview. Russia is handling President well, Trump as an asset? That's the, that seems to be the, that's the appearance to me. But the facts just don't add up. Some of the toughest sanctions ever imposed on Russia were passed under the Trump administration. Treasury remains committed to targeting Russian-backed entities that seek to profit from Russia's illegal annexation and occupation of Crimea. Our sanctions are a clear reminder that efforts seeking to normalize investment and economic relationships with those operating in Crimea will not be tolerated and are subject to U.S. and E.U. sanctions authorities. Trump has escalated the U.S. NATO military presence in Poland, right on Russia's doorstep. And Trump has presided over naval maneuvers in the Black Sea, right near Russia's sensitive military base. Trump has authorized the sale of lethal weapons to the anti-Russian government based in Kiev. Furthermore, he directly attacked the Syrian Arab Republic. His predecessor would do neither of these things. But some say it is just not far enough. The rhetoric continues that somehow he's Putin's puppet. Well, it doesn't really matter what he does. He can be totally hard on Russia. He can be harder than Obama or anybody else on Russia. They say he's not doing enough because it's all part of a greater plan to get Trump out of office. That's all it's about. It's really kind of a no-win situation in his case. The narrative is a narrative, and they're going to push it no matter what. It's almost like Trump is being backed into a corner. He <coughs> has to escalate hostilities in order to disprove the constant allegations. Caleb Maupin, RT, New York. So that's that's I think is definitely true. Uh, you know, uh, the the left and the Democrats uh, are in the habit of disagreeing or contradicting Trump, no matter what he does. Even if you know it's like a policy that uh, the liberals would more and more um, on a normal basis would support. Um, for example, like trying to pull out of a, a foreign country, trying to bring troops home, things like that. Like, like he said, at least at least said that he wanted to do with Syria. Um, so uh, this is kind of a similar thing, and it's dangerous to provoke uh, Russia. You know, it, it you know 
there needs to be diplomacy with um, other nations uh, more often rather than provoking them and wanting to uh, uh, police the world and it's you know attacking different people setting bases and uh, setting up missiles and uh, and also uh, you know Trump has been for placing uh, the the missile uh, systems along the border of Russia which is a big concern for Russia uh, you know they they feel very threatened about having those uh, you know of any kind of any any new development that break would break deterrence nuclear deterrence they they're very sensitive about Chinese red storm no longer just rising it is here the Wall Street Journal today reporting that the United States Navy and contractor are quote under cyber siege by Chinese hackers in the national security secrets stolen threaten America's standing at the world's as the world's top military power there's no way to excuse this act of cyber terror by the Chinese who are intent on becoming a dominant force on a global scale even the Obama doctrine viewed cyber attacks as acts of war when warranted it said the United States will respond to hostile acts in cyberspace as we would to any other threat to our country we recognize that certain hostile acts conducted through cyberspace could compel actions under the commitments we have with our military treaty partners we reserve the right to use all necessary means diplomatic informational military and economic as appropriate and consistent with applicable international law in order to defend our nation, our allies, our partners, and our interests. The failures of previous administrations, along with former Defense Secretary James Mattis, contributing to the lack of American cybersecurity by 2021, a staggering 3.5 million cybersecurity jobs are estimated to be vacant in both the private and the military sectors. The Trump administration's 2020 budget requesting $9.6 billion to enhance the Defense Department's cyber mission. That's just a little more than 1% of the total defense budget. Clearly, more is needed. Let's bring in Fox Business National Security and Foreign Policy Analyst Dr. Waleed Ferris and Fred Flights, national security expert and president of the Center for Security Policy. Fred, would you call this an act of war? Absolutely, David. This is an act of war that is seriously undermining U.S. national security. It is stealing a technological edge that the U.S. taxpayer has spent billions of dollars to develop and makes us much more vulnerable to China. And it raises real questions about these trade talks with China. We are at war with China. I mean, this is an act of war. And how can we trust China in these? So I think that's fair to say. I think we're in a cold war with China. Uh, they continue to uh, create bases in the Pacific that, um, you know, uh, make it easier for them to conduct a potential attack um, on mainland United States or, or on H Hawaii. Um, they have a stronger force of subs right now than we do. Like, they, their Navy is definitely getting becoming way more advanced than ours. Uh, they do want to become the the number one power, and I think that's they're the only real foreign threat that we have to worry about. But they they're definitely uh, a big threat. And uh, going back to a uh, uh, previous video, they were talking about how Google is helping build up China's uh, you know in, internet infrastructure and you, you know giving them a lot of technology. A uh, lot of uh, technological power that they're going to use to basically enslave their population, and you know, with the social credit system and uh, with the control over information, uh, you know, that's basically the goal. And um, you know, they they're they're becoming uh, imperial. Uh, they you know they they would like to take over Taiwan and and gain full control of Hong Kong. And uh, you know, they if 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 they were if they were left alone, they would take over Japan eventually, and probably the rest of the you know other island nations you got around there, and uh, the, the East Asian Pacific, like all all the territories there. 
like uh, they're they're a huge force, and um, you know that's why it's tough when 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 thinking about you know because I I want to I would love to end foreign entanglements and uh, you know and we definitely don't need to be in the Middle East that's for sure, but then you got to also think about like China's influence and how you know China basically wants to you know take over you know that side of the world and, and start influence you know spreading its influence and uh you know it's it would be the world would be a scary f- place i think a scarier place that with uh china as like the 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 lead superpower uh you know it it's um i don't i don't, I don't really think that they as bad as the united states is on on uh you, you know in a lot of different ways and the, as bad as our government is uh i think the chinese government's probably a lot worse uh, just going by what what they would they're willing to do to their own citizens uh just imagine what you know they would do to us that's what i think trade talks without any power you can't buy food you can't get fuel for a generator hospitals are struggling to keep on working it's a country in darkness people are dying This is a story that may go away for you as a viewer after you watch this. This is a story that doesn't go away for me as a, as a journalist. It, it, it stays with me constantly because I'm incredibly worried for what's going to happen with the people I know and my relatives in the country. My family, of most Venezuelan family, is quite big, so I've got a, quite a big spread of people in different parts of the country. A lot of people I'm talking to regularly uh, tell me about helplessness. They never thought it would come to this. This is like The Walking Dead. This is like living in the apocalypse. You can't go to a cash machine. You can't uh, get on the internet. Um, You cannot go to a shop and buy something you need. I've been speaking to doctors in different hospitals and they tell me how much of a struggle it is to keep, for instance, intensive care equipment going. So children with intensive care equipment had to be switched off. And when I asked her, but what happens to them in the meantime, she was like, well, they are in the hands of God. A lot of my family are asking me in London what's going on in the country because there is no way to check on your phone or they're trying to call other people but their mobile phone systems are down. And I just still don't think we know how deep of a problem it still is because some regions are virtually out of reach. <laughs> The government is calling this a cyber attack, but I think the widespread view is most most likely Venezuela has been suffering from power shortages for at least 10 years, and this is just the result of a a huge infrastructure failing. I think the major worry for all Venezuelans is that if there is a structural problem with the main dam that provides hydro energy to all of the country, then this is not going to go away. So it's crazy what's going on in in Venezuela. I mean, uh, we talked about last week how uh, it's it's partly Venezuela's fault with the the way that the government has been running the country for decades, and but also having to do with uh, the sanctions the United States has put on Venezuela as well, and uh, the fact that they never diversified their economy. Uh, so. Um, Maduro was basically blaming the blackout on the United States intervention, like he was saying, like they got hacked or, or you know, some something like that. But uh, who really knows what the source of the blackout was? Um, but all that we do know is that these these people are being slowly killed here, like literally living in an apocalyptic scenario, and that could easily happen here. Like even with just an EMP. Uh, you know, an EMP blast could wipe out all of the electronics in the United States. And, uh, you know, that that would cause tons of chaos and rioting and 
um, you know, people starving and fighting and killing in the streets. Like once you once you cut off, uh, cut cut that cut things off. You know, humans uh, they'll turn back into animals. Uh, if you if you can't get fresh food or if you can't get power, I mean, you see uh, people freak out if Facebook is down. People freak out, or if Instagram was down. That happened recently. Uh, uh, Instagram and Facebook were down. And people were, were freaking out. So just imagine if there was no running water. What if you all of a sudden you had to go take a shit outside or something? Because there's no running water or, you know, there's no good water to drink, you know? Hoy, esta belleza es nuestro nuevo petróleo. Es el agua de la calle que estamos recibiendo hoy. Es el legado eterno. Del Mortadelo Hugo Chavez. So this is supposedly somewhere in Venezuela, in San Diego, Venezuela. Crude oil pouring from the tap. Uh, whilst I cannot give any confirmation... So now we're talking about the, the shootings that happened. At the stage around uh, fatalities and casualties, what I can say is that it is clear that this is one of New Zealand's darkest days. Clearly, what has happened here is an extraordinary and unprecedented act of violence. Many of those who will have been directly affected by the shooting uh, may be migrants to New Zealand. They may even be refugees here. They have chosen to make New Zealand their home, and it is their home. They are us. The person who has perpetuated this violence against us is not. They have no place in New Zealand. There is no place in New Zealand for such acts of extreme and unprecedented violence, which is, it is clear this act was. For now, my thoughts, and I'm sure the thoughts of all New Zealanders, are with those who have been affected and also with their families. My thoughts also to those in Christchurch who are still dealing with an unfolding situation. The advice from police continues to be that um, people remain indoors. I acknowledge uh, that that may mean that some families are separated, but please continue uh, to listen out for uh, information as it comes to light that's been directly provided by the New Zealand police with further information. But as I say, they please remain in lockdown. We are potentially still dealing with an evolving situation, and again, as I say, across multiple sites. Please be assured, though, the police um, are actively managing the situation. Uh, Christchurch Hospital is dedicated uh, to treating those who are arriving at the hospital um, as we speak uh, as well. As soon as I leave here, I will be returning um, directly uh, on a, a King Air flight to Wellington. Agencies are already convening in Wellington. I will be looking to meet with them as soon as I land. It's my expectation that once I arrive and have been briefed, uh, I uh, intend uh, to speak again publicly after that point. We're just getting, uh, I think, some more pictures. And indeed, uh, I think we can might be able to bring you a, a still picture of the 28-year-old Australian man that we have been talking about, he is the suspect, uh, as we understand it, that the New Zealand authorities are looking at. Uh, this uh, picture, if we can bring it up, is of Brenton Tarrant. There you see him, uh, and I believe this is taken from uh, a video that he posted online. Now, he took to Facebook, and as we've discussed in the last half hour or so, in the most extraordinary fashion, he live streamed uh, what we believe was his attack in the Al Noor Mosque in Christchurch. It seems it was filmed with some sort of GoPro head mounted or body mounted camera. The footage showed him firing indiscriminately at men, women, and children from close range inside that central city mosque in Christchurch. And that is where we believe uh, 41 people lost their lives. 
And going back to, to you, James, and, and looking at this picture, I mean, one of the things to, to say again is how very concerned the New Zealand authorities are about that particular video. And the Interior Ministry has told people not to share it and that it may indeed be illegal to share it. Indeed. And what, what, is, what is really interesting is that video provides further evidence that this was hugely organised because a lot of the, it's, uh, the, the... From those who have watched it, and I, I have not watched it, I have chosen not to watch it, um, uh, but, uh, you know, those who have watched it say that it uh, clearly he's almost planned when he's going to say something into the camera, when he's going to shoot, when he's going to go here. It, it's, it's almost as if he's planned the, sh the angle of the shot that he's going to take, which shows an astonishing uh, degree of, of planning that has gone into this, this thing. Well, you know what, James? I, 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 like you, was reading that 74-page document that he put out, and he says in it that he... He developed the idea of launching this sort of attack two years ago, and indeed for the last three months he has been planning the specific attack on Christchurch. Yeah. Three months of his time devoted to precisely this, yeah. how he could kill the maximum number of people yeah. in an attack on Christchurch. And the, implica uh, the implication of that is that that's why he chose the particular weapons um, that he chose, uh, and that that is why... Um, uh, you know, he chose the specific locations, um, the, the, uh, you know, the document, if this is, you know, again, reflects his, his real motivations, um, explains that very, very clear, clearly, why he targeted this particular individual. And as you were saying, Carrie, it, it, a lot of it is down to, you know, New Zealand itself. And um, just, to, just to repeat, I suppose, what the New Zealand government has said about this, the content of the video is disturbing. It will be harmful for people to see. And that is why one of the reasons why we are not showing that video, Absolutely. we're only showing that still photograph from it. No. I mean, those people I, I have spoken to have, who have viewed it all say, do not watch it. James, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Let us quickly recap now uh, on the events, how these attacks unfolded. At 1.40 p.m. local time, police responded to reports of shots fired in central Christchurch. People were urged to stay indoors and report any suspicious behaviour. Shortly afterwards, all schools in the city were placed into lockdown. At 2.30 p.m., police described it as an active shooter situation. Later, at 4 p.m., New Zealand Police Commissioner Mike Bush said there'd been multiple fatalities at two locations, both mosques in Christchurch. He said that one person had been taken into custody, but warned it was unclear if more than one person was involved. Police also urged all mosques across New Zealand to shut their doors. Well, New Zealand's Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern called it one of New Zealand's darkest days. At 5.30, police said three men and one woman had been taken into custody. A short time later, Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison confirmed one of those arrested was an Australian citizen. At 7.30, Prime Minister Ardern confirmed that 40 people had died and more than 20 were seriously injured. And then at 9 p.m., the death toll rose to 49. And it was confirmed that one person had been charged with murder. The male suspect will appear at a Christchurch court on Saturday morning. OK, so... <clears throat> I'm looking through his actual manifesto right now. Man, why'd it have to be 73 pages? Holy crap. Uh, so I'm looking through this because, I don't know if you've heard, but there, there was some, uh, he, he like mentioned Candace Owens in the thing. He mentioned, uh, PewDiePie. He mentioned a couple people, which, uh, uh, some are speculating he, he, uh, mentioned not cause, uh, he was inspired by them, but that, you know, just to get more attention to, uh, this act or whatever. Um, some are saying that he's not even like a right wing person. Like he's a, he, he's like a communist or something, but I'm just kind of cycling through this. Oh, here we go. Are you a neo-Nazi? This is a very broad category of people. I don't believe so. Where are you a conservative? No, conservatism is corporatism in disguise. I want no part of it. 
It sounds kind of like uh, something a communist might say. Where are you a Christian? That is complicated. So he's not Christian. He's not a conservative. But he's saying he's a fascist. For once the person that will be called a fascist. Blah, blah, blah. No. Are you right wing depending on the definition? Sure. Are you left wing depending on the definition? Sure. And I'm sure uh, the media is is uh, trying trying to portray him as like a right wing uh, person because that's who you would expect. That's what the the media hypes up that this is you know that there is this threat of um, white uh, right right wing uh white nationalists that are just waiting to strike and sure there are kkk and neo-nazis and stuff like that but they're like fringe things that i don't i don't really see them other than like what's being provoked like with these rallies with Ant you got antifa on one side and then, and then you have like uh nationalist extremists on one side and it's kind of like they're you know meant to hype one another up to get get both of them uh radical to radicalize people because in the 90s uh you know there wasn't so much of this it's it's just become a resurgence and the manipulation of media on uh and and uh, also a big part of it also the democratic party like stoking racial tensions and you know i think that i think that uh this wasn't so much of an issue uh like 20 years ago but now it's like media is obsessed like oh are you a racist are you a uh, uh you know, against women, are you uh, against Jews, uh, you know. And why does this even have anything to do with the United States? Why is it that we have uh, politicians immediately jumping on this as like a uh, excuse to, con you know, for gun, for gun control, more gun control and limiting gun rights? It's, I don't know, it's a very weird event. Why the hell did he write 70 something pages? What the hell? Like, what is this? Were you taught violence and extremism by video games? Yes. Yeah, Spiral the Dragon 3 taught me ethno nationalism. Fortnite trained me to be a killer and to floss on the corpses of my enemies. What the fuck? What is this? Oh, here's what she, where he talks about Candace Owens. Is there a particular person that radicalized you the most? Yes, the person that has influenced me above all was Candace Owens. Each time she spoke, I was stunned by her insights and her own views helped push me further and further into the belief of violence over meekness. Though I will have to disavow some of her beliefs, blah, blah, blah. And what's crazy about that is... Uh, in response, Candace Owens tweeted something like LOL, something, something. And uh, I guess she didn't really know what the hell to, to, to say in response. And so people were kind of like, you know, like, oh, this is like a serious thing. Like, what are you saying LOL about? It's like such a weird response. And, that, and it is a weird response. Let me see. Let's see if they have the tweet. Where's the tweet? Okay. In several wait. In several tweets issued as bodies were still being counted, Owens jeered at critics whom she said were attempting to pin responsibility for the massacre on her. Quote, LOL fact, I've never I never created any consent espousing my views on the second amendment for or Islam. Uh, Owens said in response to one now deleted tweet the left pretending I inspired a mosque massacre in New Zealand because I believe black America can do it without government handouts is the reachiest reach of all reaches, LOL. So yeah, it's kind of uh, 
kind of a weird response uh, to being accused of being responsible. I mean, I mean, it is kind of a stupid, uh, some uh, stupid allegation in any way to say that she really had influence of this over this guy, this Australian guy. Because let me tell you, like I know Austra- I know a couple of Australians. Like I've I've talked to people from Australia, and they don't they don't really pay attention to U.S. politics like that. Generally speaking, they don't really pay attention to U.S. politics like that. Uh, you know, at most a foreigner might know if they're anti-Trump or not, just based on some, you know, whatever they hear on their side of, of the world. But I mean, just think about what you hear about foreign primary prime ministers and stuff. Like we don't really get so much detail, nor, nor do, are we really that interested in, 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 in all the specific, the, all the specifics of uh what's going on with any other particular country i mean in general in generally speaking i mean i i read the news a lot and i still don't i'm still not that invested in in like the politics of other countries like i'll just kind of get the the broad uh, uh, some, uh the broad uh date uh details or whatever about about whatever situation for example brexit like i haven't really looked into brexit all that much I, I, I look at news every once in a while about it, but I don't fully understand it. And this is only page 16. Oh my gosh. We're not looking through the whole thing. I just kind of want to see what the hell is in here. It wasn't exactly easy to find either, I think. Man, it really wrote a lot of shit. The hell? Bunch of links. Uh. What the heck? Well, I think you get the picture. It's a very odd. It's like he he spots all this crazy shit, and then he'll reference Fortnite. What the hell? (laughs) That's so crazy. All right, well. uh, That's it for the show today. I'm going to go make a burger. We covered a lot of news. Uh, if you're watching on, well, you're watching on Twitch, so uh, please follow me. If you haven't already, hit the follow button on Twitch. I upload this show to YouTube as well. Uh, I'm on YouTube, youtube.com forward slash the MC Faceman, twitter.com forward slash the MC Faceman for updates. Etc. Etc. You guys have a great Sunday and have a great week.